let's talk about something. Hey everyone, today I have my friend Q with me. We are running um, through a few ideas. I'm not actually quite sure, but I have some idea. I'm very excited. Before we start, we're both drinking teas today. Well, I'm drinking apple cider vinegar with, I cheated today, a half a spoonful of sugar. So living my best life over here. Um, Q, what are you drinking? Orange tea with honey flavor. Look at us. So holistic, so delicious. Okay, so what are we talking about today? Well, there are a couple things that we've been batting around. Um, identity and love. And I was thinking about them, and as I was sort of playing around with both ideas, mm -hmm. I found that there's an interesting overlap between them that hopefully we'll get to. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. Do you want to start with love or identity? Um, I'm kind of in the mood for love. Okay. Me too. Okay. So I really like uh, the idea that we have of love being a mode where you open up to someone, you bring them into your life, and you say to them, hey, you, I trust you. You get to help me be a better person. Not necessarily even a better person by my standards, but a better person by your standards. Mm. Like. Because if I, if I just went by my standards, I don't need you. <laughs> like I, I, I'm trusting you to help me out in ways that maybe I don't know how to do. Yeah. And, and I'm, not, I'm not just hiring you to be like my, my coach where I'm saying, hey, I want to work out harder. Tell me, you know, help me work out harder. I'm saying I trust you to see my gaps, my flaws, mm. and things that I don't see, and you're going to help me work on them in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Um. It's a really difficult process, though, and you can't do it with everyone. I, I feel like that's part of what winds up limiting love is you, you're you giving someone all this power and, and trust, and so you do have to, it opens up all these fresh questions of when someone comes to you and says, um, you know, I need to have control over your finances, or I need to have control over your schedule, or I need to have control over what you eat. Or something like that there's a point where that becomes obviously dangerous mm. mm -hmm. how do we make these decisions becomes a question you know like how how do i know when someone's telling me what to do and i love them and trust them that they actually know what they're doing like right. maybe i'm just putting a huge amount of responsibility on them a burden that they're not prepared for and their response to it is to just try to control everything and that wasn't the right thing to do because they don't have this experience either. You know, mm -hmm. they, they're new to this business. They, they know that I need some help, but they don't really know what to do. They don't know what's going to work. So it's a very experimental process. I feel like it's inherently going to lead to a lot of uh, traumatic mistakes and opportunities mm -hmm. to, to learn and grow and trust someone. And that when we enter into this loving relationship and we extend this out to someone, we'd be a little bit crazy to expect it to work right off yeah right right away it's mm. gonna it's gonna fail do you think like the um type of personalities that end up um go i feel like the type of personality that you are contributes to how you handle specific situations especially about like freedom or choice i think of the conservative bubble i grew up in and like how men are the breadwinners and the women stay home and in some ways those women are really just trusting those men to actually not throw them to the curb right but then a lot of women i meet are so anti-women staying home and not having their own income for reasons like this. But then I see perfectly healthy relationships where it makes sense that the woman gives the money to the man, but not literally, like she just happens to be a stay-at-home mom, which is basically saying, I hope you love me forever. <laughs> and I hope you don't abandon me and the kids, but then people do all the time. So I feel like the personality that goes into it helps contribute to how the like conversation even happens. Um, like I'm thinking of a warmer personality, maybe somebody who's more open to like team building versus somebody who's very like, I've got it. Don't even ask me. So yeah. I feel like the amount of fights and the amount of like disconnect that's going to occur is how you approach it. But I don't think it happens universally. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, I would just say this cause you immediately remind me that, you know, that 1950s housewife model was one where the man gave all the money to the woman where it was part of her housekeeping job to manage the money. What bubble to, is that? 1950s housewife bubble. I never experienced that, so I don't well, know what that is. Uh, you know, leave it to Beaver. Okay, okay. Yeah, you know, that 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 model where the man goes out and works, and he's out there in the working world, 
and he gets his paycheck and he hands it to the woman and says, here's a pile of money, buy food, clean the house, take care of things. Like Mm -hmm. I'm getting the money. Your job is to spend the money. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's no expectation in those scenarios that the woman is going to do something terrible with the money for the most part, because they don't have that much money in the first place. You know, interesting. She's not going to run off with all his money because they don't have and all his money to run off with. And, you know, if she runs off, there won't be an inflow of money anymore. So her, her natural, she, she's not empowered by taking care of all the money. The money is a burden. The money's a job. Mm. The money is, is part of her, her side of this thing. And I think that when people look back on this time and they think, you know, oh, women didn't make any money. They didn't have any control. No, they had all the money. Like the man's the one who had no money. Like, yeah, maybe he would save a little bit of money and go to a bar or something. But the housewife knew how much he got paid. She was budgeting for all these things. And she had the ability to say to him, hey, I know you're making this much money. We need to spend this much on food or we're going to starve. Where's the money? Mm. I guess I, I'm I. So in my household, my mom also did the money and she still does. Um and she is like the reason my parents are now millionaires, basically, because my dad was busy making the money. He didn't have time to like also manage the money. It's like a full time job <laughs> to like figure out where to put money and how to invest, it, especially as an immigrant or like. So my parents learn these skills later in life after they're done raising kids. I'm learning these skills in my little 30s and I'm way behind some of my friends who are learning it in their 20s. Like how to invest money is so beyond my understanding. So I do have that bubble that I. I have that lived experience, but then I hear from other people who say that like their women never saw their money. They weren't allowed to touch money, that women were never allowed to have access to their money. So then I think about those relationships and I'm thinking that's the difference. So in my family, my dad loves my mother, cares for my mother, wants to take, wants my mother to be his teammate. So of course he would share the responsibilities of money with my mother. Mm -hmm. But in a colder relationship in which there's like, like a low trust community, we talk about that a lot. Maybe the husband would hoard the money or the wife would hoard the money. And so they're not really on a team. And I think that causes a lot of the bickering and the fighting. But going back to what you said in the beginning, are you referring to couples that are kind of toxic-y? Or are you saying even healthy relationships have these moments of like di- like tension, I guess? Did I misunderstand you in the beginning? Well, so at the beginning of this process, so, you know, you know in that – that 1950s perfect household model, that, that's everything functioning normally. Mm. And, you know, another part of that is that the woman, by doing all the cooking and all that other stuff, she's in charge of the man's health. Yeah. Like, she, she's the one who's supposed to be looking at him and saying, he's getting a little fat, I'll feed him less. Like, maybe I'll lie to him about how much food costs. Like, I'll do whatever it takes. <laughs> I'll feed him less because it's her responsibility on that team to take care of that. Mm-hmm. because, you know, for whatever reason, he's getting fat. Like, he can't he can't manage that. So this is one of those things where when you're on a team, you help someone out in whatever way you can. Um, but what I was saying is when all this starts, though, you have newlyweds, mm. they're not good at it. And, you know, there's, there's all the examples, stories of you get the newlyweds, the man goes out and gets the paycheck, gives it to the woman, and she goes out and spends it foolishly. And then they don't have anything to eat that week because right. she spent it on a fur coat or whatever. Um, so, yeah, newlyweds make countless mistakes. And you're mm-hmm. expected to go through that rough and tumble. You're you're expected to learn, though. You're expected to grow. You're expected to say, oh, wow, I screwed up and I don't have anything to feed my husband. I feel bad about that. And the response in a low trust environment is, yeah, the man's going to say, I gave her all the money. We have no food. I can't trust her with money. I'll keep it myself. I'll feed myself. I won't Mm. trust her. It has to go the other way, though. It has to be we as a team screwed up, and I'm going to keep trusting her. I'm going to let her fix this on her own. Mm. And and maybe I'll point out that I'm starving so she'll understand that there's a problem, but it's got to be her problem to solve. She she has to, to do the things that she has to do as part of our team. I can't be... I can't simultaneously do everything myself and have the benefits of being on a team. Which is interesting because right now there's like that parallel relationship thing that's happening or like if you have multiple partners, I mean, to some extent, you're all doing stuff alone. To some extent, some of your life has to be not on a team, right? So I guess the 
I I guess for me, I wonder, it sounds so conservative to say that, like, you have to be on a team and team looks like monogamy. Well, yeah, because that's not true. Right, I mean, but that's kind of what you're implying, right? Because the parallel relationships or those poly relationships with eight partners, those people aren't living every day with each other. Like, they're having usually, like, roommate relationships. Well, it gets into the question of what what we're talking about benefiting from a team. So mm-hmm. there's emotional stability. Mm-hmm. There, there's that side of it. There's psychological development and growth and encouraging people to read books or anything of that nature. Um, then there's the more simple practical things like if you have a relatively reasonable space to live, two people can live there as easily as one, four people can live there as easily as two, um, you just have to have the right number of bedrooms, the right amount of kitchen space, and suddenly you have all these economies of scale. You you can't put 50 people in there. Oh, wait. Wait, you cut out audio. Can't hear you now. There we go. Okay, we cut out. The internet was being internet-y. Okay. Okay, say that again? Or... Um, well, I was saying that, that the economies of scale work for the poly relationship just as much as for the monogamous so long as the living space facilitates it. Mm. You know, cooking a meal for four people, it, it's it's basically the family at that point. You know, I, it, it's, it gets a little confusing, but I think that when you remember that children exist and that you love children, you take care of children, then you can imagine swapping around children and polygamous partners as just like a mouth to feed, a person to take care of, someone who needs a bed. Like, you, you can expand that out to some point. What about this? I had a friend who used to ask, he used to tell me like, oh, my friends are just as important to me as my partner. And I'm like, well, that seems inefficient. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, I know you're poly and everything, but like, I'm your friend and I don't give a fuck like how you spend your finances or like where you move. Like, why are you acting like, you know, so when we talk about love, are we, and we're talking about, I assume romantic love only, how would you explain what you just defined as love as someone making you a better person? How is that different from friendship or roommates? It doesn't have to be. I, I think, um, so we've talked about this before, but I, I found it convenient these days to divide it up between love as the amount that you care about someone, your feelings towards them, the degree to which your values are connected to them, and then the practicalities of things, which is, you know, do we live in the same place? Can we share meals? Can can we make babies that we can actually take care of? Mm. And there's not a, there's not a, direct connection between these two. It's great when it all works out. When it all works out, then you have a loving relationship with the person who you live with and you make babies and you care about your babies and all that stuff. But there are times when you love someone that you can't have a very practical relationship with. And that can lead to a bunch of weird situations. Like if you love someone who has no ability to know that you exist, Mm. then suddenly you can become a stalker. Yeah. And, and you can just get weirdly obsessed because your 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 love isn't the correct kind of, you know, it, you don't really care about them. It can get kind of twisted. But yeah. there's moments where you can be friends with someone, and I'm thinking of us here, mm. where you help someone, you care about them, but we don't have the ability. You know, we're not living together. We don't cook each other's meals. We don't get the economies of scale there, <laughs> but we can be on each other's team. We yeah. can provide emotional support, advice perspective you know i can tell you things you can tell me things and i can trust you to give me advice that's going to be helpful to me that i wouldn't have thought of yeah and that i think is love without the practical things that involve winding up you know married to someone do you believe that you can um love someone unconditionally um yes and no i mean unconditionally is like everyone and anyone and there's all these words where obviously no not unconditionally if if the aliens zap someone with their mind control you know device and they make them try to kill me uh then probably you know the relationship is going to suffer i i, I don't know what, i don't know what unconditional means when people start using that well okay so the reason i was thinking about it was because you're talking about this love and we can help each other but since we live in different bubbles where we have different morals or ethics, whether it's my siblings or my inner circle, whoever they are, I'm, I love them as the consciousness, but like if they did something pretty horrific, I don't think my love would change because once inner circle, I feel like always inner circle, 
but how I interact with them will change. So it's sort of like the transitional or transitional, transactional. Maybe part of the relationship might change. Like maybe it's not as symbiotic, but the love fe I feel stays the same. And I only know that because I've lived through it where I've noticed that I've been in relationships romantically where the partner has been like, let's say, um, like more toxic-y and I've loved them, but I didn't unconditionally love them and I no longer speak to them. They're no longer my life. Then I have people in my life that are my ride or die. I unconditionally love them and they have done worse things than even the exes I've had. And I still love them the same. The love never changes. If anything, I feel like I love them more because I'm like, oh, I love you so much. Why are you doing this? Right? My love doesn't change, but the conditions in which I interact with them do change. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to use the word transactional as a synonym for practical. Because I feel okay. like I feel like transactional gets you back into that space that I like to, that in my mind, I think of as I will love you if you take out the trash. Like it, it's it's now a purchasing kind of thing going back and forth. But that's Whereas why pra practical is more just a question of do we have a, a trash bag that one of us can take out and thus the other person doesn't have to. It it's a you know it's a benefit. Uh, but the, so let's take the the simplest case of unconditional love. Someone straightforwardly says to you. I never want to see you again or, you know, like, or, or whatever it is, you know, they're just cutting you out of their life. Can you still love them? Well, sure. I mean, it, it unambiguously takes all the practical things out. You can't even talk to them. You don't. And, you know, if they're not a famous person, you don't even know where they are or what they're mm. doing. You know nothing about them, but you can still have all the same feelings for them. And if they show up again one day, you can be like, welcome back. Like, yeah, I loved you right. the whole time. You were gone. Now you're back. Nothing right. has changed. You, you, I think that the love can persist without any practical conditions being met. I agree. I agree. So when I think about love making you better or to love someone is to allow them to make you better, I, th I do think of that with every relationship in which love exists. Um, the love is on a spectrum. And then that will infer how practical or impractical we can be when interacting with a person, right? Um, n well, no. Oh, okay. I, mean, I, I think the, I think the real world dictates the practicalities. Oh, like, interesting. I think you, you could be completely and totally 100% <coughs> in love with someone and they could be in prison. And like, that's going to be a practical problem that gets in the way of you sharing expenses, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you imagine so, you call so, them up. You're like, hey, that $2 for shaving blades. I need it to go towards electricity that you're not using. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't think, I don't think love guarantees practicality or practicality guarantees love. I don't think the connection works that way. I do think that the, there's a kind of synthesis and harmony that you only get when you have both of them. Like if you are in love with someone who you live with, then you get something that you can't have just by being in love or just by living with them. Say that again. Um, if you live with someone as a roommate, then you can only have sort of a roommate kind of lifestyle. And if you love someone, but for practical reasons, they're really far away from you, then you can only have a distant, I like that person a lot kind of, kind of lifestyle. But if you, love them and you live with them or you know you basically share practicalities then you can have something that is better than either of those on their own it's better than having a roommate it's better than a long distance love you 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 can achieve things that you could only achieve by loving the person that you're actually with yeah i think that's more than reasonable just because of i feel like there's like a like a out of sight, out of mind thing that happens as well for my brain, at least where like I can love someone, but I, if they're not directly in my every day, it kind of feels silly to think of them as my, in every second. But if they were here, I would hear them or I would smell them or I would like notice a cup in the sink. And so like, it would just change how I interacted. Okay. I'm losing my, I need like a sense of direction for this thought process though, because I feel like it's that all makes sense. Because it's a psychological thing. It's about your well-being. It's not about the practicalities. It's not like you. Yeah. It's not like loving someone means that you take the trash out any better. Like the the practical aspects of life don't get better than having a really good roommate. Like the practicality tops out at the top of the practicality. Love tops out at the top of the love. But when you combine the two, then you get a psychological well-being, a sense of existence, meaning, fulfillment things that you don't get with either on their own. Yeah, for sure. 
I'm trying to like, th I'm obviously thinking about like different relationships now that I'm passing it through my mind. So wait, how does this, what sense of like, where direction do you want to take this conversation? Because I'm, I feel like this is like, okay, we are, we agree. Okay. Well, we're, we're close to values, which mm. uh, is something about, you know, being with someone. Oof. And, and I was thinking that one of the issues that I often feel when I listen and, and maybe that comes up and adds confusion is when you talk about sharing values with someone, there's, there's one set of values, which is a kind of superficial, uh, do you like vanilla ice cream? I like vanilla ice cream. We both like the same thing. Therefore, we share values. But then there's another set of maybe meta values, but you know, I don't want to complicate it. Another kind of value, which is, do you like new things? I like new things. I've already had vanilla ice cream. I want something new. And it doesn't matter like what it is. I just want something new. You mm -hmm. want something new. And we can both have a value that we share of exploring new and different things. For sure. And that can be, let's try going off on a meditation retreat. Let's try traveling to, to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Like it can be whatever it is. It, and it can be about not hey, we have this thing that we like doing. Let's do this again and again and again. Mm -hmm. It can be, let's constantly change and be in flux and follow the adventures of each other's lives. And I think it's more difficult when you're talking in that situation to look at someone and say, do they share my values? Because they might, you might walk up to them and they say, my favorite ice cream is chocolate. And you would say, my favorite ice cream is vanilla. We don't have the same values. But no, you have the same values, just you've never tried chocolate and they've never tried vanilla. And I think we need to define values. Isn't that just like a preference like versus a value? No. Well, I'm using, I'm using it as a simplified example okay, of, of, of a deeper value. When I think of values, it's like when I say I don't compromise and everyone's like, what does that mean? I was like, I only compromise who does the dishes, not values. So the value of like wanting it, like I don't date people who want to go to a new country every week or every month or every year too many times. It's great, though. I love it for my friends. Like, I see them. They go off. They adventure. They're always in new cities, always in new towns. And I love that for them. Um, I'm just not that person. And I don't value it for my life. And I, if anything, it gives me anxiety. It makes me hate my life. So I don't think it matters that for one person. Like, that's the point. If you value something with someone, you should talk about it to see if you match enough to not make each other feel like you're driving each other crazy. Because you, like, one person decided to date. Like, wouldn't it be unfair of me to date an adventurer? It's like why I don't date high performance athletes. Like they probably like most of them that I know want to date women who want to go on hikes with them or want to run with them. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I got lupus lungs. So that's the question I have. Right. Isn't that what we're talking about? We're talking about choosing wisely partners that will facilitate your values. Ultimately. Yeah. But OK, so I guess what I'm getting at is that part of your values can be introspective, spiritual growth and openness to change. Mm -hmm. So you might have a current desire to be stable, to stay in, stay in the same country, to you know not go on long walks, but you might be open to change. Yeah. Whereas some people would not be open to change. And I think that there's a kind of person who, when they're meeting someone, if, if you are a fundamentally stable person who doesn't want to change and you you know, connect with someone else who is open to change and wants to change, but in the moment happens to be doing what you like. Mm. So you're both living in the same place. You're both staying in the same place. And it seems like you're compatible. Well, one of you really expected to do that for your whole life. And the other one expected to do it for a year. Yeah. And, and you didn't understand that maybe like, you couldn't understand it. You might not have had the perspective to even ask the right questions. Or if, if you were asked, you might not have known that you were going to change. It just, it's something that you learn as you get a little bit older and you look back on your life and you see, oh, look, I changed every couple of years. Yeah. Then you know. But you know, when you're young, you think, no, oh, this is just who I am and who I'm always going to be. Um, so I think that's sort of what I'm saying is that, that you have to have enough perspective to know whether or not what you want is even going to be what you always want. Right. So which is why like you investigate the self, right? Like what does it mean to exist or be a person? 
So I guess that's what I mean to say. Like when you say when you say you, I have to remember you're not talking about me, Brittany, literally, right? Yeah. Okay, so like that's what it throws me. So when you're like, when I'm listening, I'm like, to what? To who? So you're not actually like, we don't disagree then. No, well, well, insofar as I think that you've already done that investigation, like you've looked at your life and you can see who you are and where you've gone and why you why you were this, why you were that, right. what you really wanted, what your inner values were. And, and so you know yourself. And I think I know myself. Uh, so I don't think we have any questions like, you know, who am I going to be tomorrow? I don't think that's a mystery for us. I don't think it's a mystery for a lot of people, though. I actually think most people, a lot of them that I meet, they're basically the same people that I know. Everyone from high school is basically the same they were. I think that, though, is – I think there's – that maybe that's part of what I'm trying to get at, though, is I think most people are relatively stable people who don't change much. And so we have this illusion that no one changes much. Mm. But I think the dynamic people – are lurking in the midst of these more stable people and they think that they're stable, but then they change. Yeah. And then they think, okay, now I've found the real me, but then they change again. Yeah. And it takes them a little while to realize, no, I'm a changer. I'm, I'm a changer. I yeah. I, I need, I need this. This is who I really am. We talked about this the other day, I think, but like, I feel like I ended up the person I always was like as a child, I feel like I reverted back to my original personality. Like I tried a lot of different versions of myself and I find myself to be like a really consistent changing person, but not a changer in the way that other people like I feel like I changed so much in my 30 or 20s on purpose. Like I was like, OK, let's try wearing this makeup. Let's try being this fashion. Let's try being this Britney. All these Britneys exist in me temporarily. But the most default Britney is the one that I am now. And I find that she's the strongest voice in my subconscious. And I feel like she's the um, most joyful version of myself. So I don't think I'm going to change much from here on out. I think I did all my major changing in my 20s. But I do think that I'm going to change into a wiser person. And I do think that I'm going to grow into a hopefully a like a like a just a more like a older version of this self. But I'm not going to like wake up tomorrow and be like, should I get like horns in my forehead? <laughs> should I split my tongue? Which is something I considered in my 20s, not the horns. But I did consider like um, piercings or specific tattoos. I was like, I would literally consider it a neck tattoo to such a degree that I had my friend like draw a neck tattoo on me to see if I liked it good enough for like a day. And then I was like, I don't think I'm going to like this for the rest of my life. But I was very open to it. And now I'm not even like it's not even on my radar. So that's interesting because I think some people would say, but you could want it one day. And I'm like, I could want it one day, but it still doesn't mean I'm going to do it. And so I wonder about that. Like, how would you, like, for me, I look at people on, like, obviously a spectrum. So I say, okay, these are the people that I don't even know what they're going to do next week. And mm -hmm. these are the people that I know, oh, okay, for the next five years, they're at least going to do this. And then for the next 30 years, I know this person's definitely going to do this. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Which category, like, do you know which one you're in versus, like, which version you were in your 20s, 30s, 40s? You know what I mean? Like, inver like I know... Like I could pinpoint my times of when I was like, oh, here's the changing Britney cycle, the consistent Britney cycle, this Britney. You know what I'm saying? I do. I I don't choose to look at my life in that way of trying to like frame individual moments. Oh, okay. Um, it connects to identity, uh, but I'll try to like address this. I might not be able to without bringing that in. Um, I I look at myself now as who I am mm -hmm. and I look at my past not often as changing but just as encompassing different spaces mm -hmm. so I see myself as being this person who has sort of moved around these spaces and grown and developed and I definitely see myself as someone who wants to change and, and so forth and it isn't very isn't just going to stay in one place forever um, so I'm open to the idea that where I am now won't be where I'll be in the future, mm -hmm. and, but I'll still carry this core identity of being this changing open person. Mm -hmm. um, the way I wanted to connect it to identity was when you talk about identity, sometimes I feel like, well, I'll just throw out a, a phrase that you've used sometimes, which is the, you know, I'm acting in my masculine mm. and for me, that aspect of it is always a kind of strange thing. And I want to hear what you have to say about this. But what I hear from that sometimes is I'm leaving my core identity and I'm hopping over to this other 
place where I'm going to pretend to be a man in some sense. And I find that distasteful because mm. I like whatever it is that you're pretending to be a man to do, like, let's say, be brave enough to like walk through a dark alley or something. I feel like that's something that you could have done as a woman. You could say, I'm a woman who's brave and wants to walk, walk through a dark alley. I don't have to be, I don't have to pretend to be a man. I don't mm. have to pretend to leave my current identity. I can just say, I happen to be a woman who's brave and and bring all of that identity into who you are. Um. Okay, hold on. Mm. Okay, I just want to say something and then I'll answer that. I thought about like, um. you know how Farm Brother is always moving around? He like always yeah. moves. And he's the same person no matter where he moves. Like, some people would say, oh, my gosh, you're always changing. You're always moving. And they do. They literally criticize him and tell him, like, you're always moving your family. And him and his family are like, yeah, but we're moving to be better Catholics. So they're always the same in their heads. But to, and to me, too, I was like, yeah, you're just, like, being more Catholic. That's, like, the same thing you were yesterday. But to other people, they're like, oh, you're changing your location. You're changing your identity. And I'm like, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. So I think that's interesting. Like, that perception, and I see it. Like, okay, that's weird. So, okay, I just wanted to say that out loud. The second thing is... I imagine the core self and I imagine all these like branches and there's Brittany and then there's all the different versions of Brittany, Brittany when she's with her mother, Brittany when she's at the dungeon, Brittany when she's, when I'm in my masculine, I change the way I sit. I do it naturally too, like without even thinking because I'm just like the mood is shifted. I'm now this, especially like um, when situations call for it. Like have you ever been in a situation where like shit hits the fan? You have to like walk to the car at night and there's like maybe a bear outside if somebody is afraid next to me, I automatically go, I will be the, like, I go, I will, you know, automatically. But if somebody is more confident than I am, I'm like, and now I'm the pussy. <laughs> <laughs> but in the same circumstance, in the same 10 minutes, I can just shift based off of what is needed. That's what it feels like. It feels like I am evoking every part of me at once, but more parts of me should be more dominant at a certain, at a certain moment. So it's not that I put my core aside. It's that my core is like, and, oh, we need this person. Bring it out, Brittany. Because she's not, I'm not like, like right now in this state of being, I'm a very specific Britney, right? Like, I'm not like my sassy gay Britney. I'm not like my BDSM Britney. I'm not lover Britney. Like, I'm just talking to cute Britney. <laughs> like, you know, we're discussing a pretty level-headed, you know, level-headed conversation. So that's what I think of it as. My core is already, my core is the mastermind who's like, and bring in the soldier. Or like if I'm playing a video game, you put on different armor to fight different mm -hmm. bad guys. That's how I think of it. Yeah, I, I think for me, it's a question of the, the emphasis as to mm. whether or not you're losing something when you do it. Like, when you shift into brave mode, do you lose something that you had in the other mode? Like, you can only wear one set of armor at a time. So part of it is why I don't like that as a metaphor, is it suggesting that when you're wearing the physically strong armor, you're not wearing the magically strong armor. But you yourself are potentially like you you could put them both on at the same time yeah if you had to like you could you could be both i'm going to be brave and strong and i'm also going to be hyper intelligent and i'm also going to be very feminine like you can mix and combine these things in a way that saying in my masculine feels like it gives up because it feels like you're saying oh i'm drifting from feminine to masculine so i'm going to give up my feminineness to become you know masculine for a little while but you don't have to. You can bring the feminine to the masculine or bring the masculine to the feminine and, and blend it together. It goes dormant. Is that the same thing to you as putting it aside? Well, take, take the armor example. Like, do you understand what I mean? That I, I want to think of it in terms that, that enable me to put two sets of armor on at once. What's that girl on Lord of the Rings that kills the guy? He goes, no man will ever kill me. And she goes, I am no man. <laughs> that lady? Hey, okay, she's a feminine masculine in that moment. But I, Brittany, am rarely feminine masculine in those moments. When I'm in my mask, I'm usually straight up in my masculine. See, I never, well, I disagree because I don't see her as masculine in that moment. I see her as pronouncedly feminine. Like, that's the whole point of the scene. Well, I think the point is that we don't know she's a woman. So we see her in a masculine role because we assume in the masculinity of her armor, she's and she is being masculine in that moment. Like, in masculinity and femininity, even, like, Jordan Peterson talks about this, like, there is a different in, difference in nature. There's a difference in how we feel things. There's a difference in how it presents. Um, 
so I feel like that's just the beauty of life is that it is like a spectrum of experience. That you don't need to be all or nothing or one or the other. You can be one or the other, all and nothing, all this. Like, you can be any of them. Well, this is sort of the crux of <clears> what <throat> I was going to get at with the identity thing. Mm. You were saying earlier, before we started, that uh, in your that you don't think that I have a strong sense of identity. And I'll agree with that. <clears throat> or right. at least I, I don't identify with with things that you could try to identify me with very much. And for me, that's because identity is like a kind of self-bigotry. But it shows in the way you talk that your identity obviously influences you because you speak from your experience. That's why I think it's funny you don't own your identities because you obviously are informed by them. Okay, well, what I'm saying is... See, what you're saying there is exactly what I was about to say, which is my identity is me. My identity is me and my experiences not any one other label that you could ever try to put on me. I just don't think you're able to exist in the world and in a bubble, which you were born into a bubble and you lived in a bubble, you live in a bubble now, and you're not influenced and informed by that bubble. You're a human, meaning your psychology is literally influenced by your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, your uncles, like who and what your genetics are. And your genetics come from a very specific line. And so as your introspection allows you to interact with the self outside of those bubbles, but you're still informed your whole life by those bubbles, right? Like if you go back on your life and you think about the choices you've made, you can pinpoint usually if you're, you know, oh, I understand. I did this because I was raised in this environment and I thought this way. So you're being informed by what? An identity? Like why did you make certain choices you've made in your life? Usually, I assume, because of the way you thought of your life at that moment. But through the lens of usually your, your identity. Like, oh, I was raised in a Christian home, um, so I can't get divorced. Oh, I was raised in this kind of environment. I thought to be a real man, you have to be this way. Have you never had man struggles? Like, as a man, I have to feel like this. No. So I, I guess this is what I'm trying to say is... Wait, 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 wait. That is not true. No, you've it is. literally told me about dates you've gone on women, and as a man, you act accordingly. Yes. No, yes. No, I, so, I do. I, so, but that's... The difference is the ordering and how these things actually exist in my mind. Mm. So it's not that I think, Oh, I'm a man. And what man do is this. Therefore I have to do that. It's I'm me. I think that this is the right thing to do. I happen to be a man. Therefore I think this is what men should do. I think that the identities flow from my experience. My experience doesn't flow from the identities. Right. I, I, but, but what I'm saying is I've never looked and said, oh, what's the Christian way to be? And not, not never. I mean, obviously there are moments here and there, but fundamentally, I don't look and say, oh, what's the Christian thing? Therefore, that's what I should do. Like, you know, Christians eat fish on Friday. I should eat some fish on Friday. That's not me. I've always been... I'm me, and I happen to be in this Christian bubble. What are the Christians doing? Okay, well, that's what the fuck the Christians are doing. Like, that's them. That's not me. I've never, I've never felt a need to impose something upon myself about what I should do or how I should fit in. Frankly, part of this is because of the books that I read when I was young and the way that my identity was formed. But I always much more closely associated with the alien who arrives on earth and is looking at everything through fresh eyes or the um, person who like is transported to a fantasy world and everything is different and they're a stranger. So stranger in a strange land, like that kind of model for me is very much how I have approached life. You could say, oh, well, you're in a body of this particular type in this particular shape. And in my mind, it's very much that, no, I just wound up with this. Okay. This isn't who I am. This is just the, the the operational vehicle that I'm in. Are you a community member? Like, do you like being part of a community? No. Okay, so I think that's the difference. I love being a part of a community. <laughs> I am a lone wolf, but I was raised in a community. I belong to communities. When I go to Arabic stores and they find out I'm Middle Eastern, I am officially brought in. I've, given, I've been given free stuff my whole life, discounted prices on stuff, because I'm a part of their community just by being Middle Eastern. 
So I was raised my whole life being apart. Clearly, when I'm Catholic, people knew my parents' last name and I'd go to Catholic churches and people were like, oh, you're one of them? Welcome. Why? Because I'm a part of the community. Once a Catholic, always a Catholic. You know what I'm saying? I'm Middle Eastern. I can use that. I'm queer. I'm welcomed. I'm like woman and I'm like pro-women. So like I have always been a part of communities. Have you been not a part of communities most of your life, would you say? I... When I was a child, I obviously like didn't have much control over things, so I'm sort of dismissing that. Sure. Um, it, it, in my adult life, I have never been a part of communities, other than in the sense of like briefly visiting and seeing like, well, what's this like? Um, there, there's never been a community where I decided, oh, I have found my people. Um. So, like, you know how they say they've done all these studies on, like, people need community consistency and structure? And that's why religious people are happier than agnostic or atheist people because they don't have those things usually. I understood that I was bubble hopping later in life. But as, as I look back now, I'm like, oh, okay, that's what I was doing as a kid, right? I was born into a specific bubble, but then I met my friend who was, like, a Democrat. And I'm like, wait, you can be a Democrat? And then, like, what's that, what's that like? And then, like, she told me what that was like. And then I was like, oh, okay. Like, she has a gay aunt. And I was like, whoa, what's that like? Like, I have 17 aunts and uncles on just my mom's side, and none of them are gay. So, like, let's talk about that, you know? And so that already made me realize, like, oh, okay, in her community, they do this. In my community, we do this. When you were growing up as a kid, did you have a community that you ever, like, actually felt a part of or liked? No. Okay. <clears throat> I think that makes sense then that you wouldn't maybe have such a strong tie to identity versus me. It's like all I was raised with were parents who were persecuted for their identity. And then I was persecuted for my identity by those parents. Right. So like the irony is that I have to be aware of identity because it's informed. Wait. You know what I mean? Huh? Well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll agree that you, you are aware of identity. Obviously, I'm aware of identity. I know what it is. I see it you know, all around me. But I don't necessarily think that means that I have to go along with it. I enjoy I, I, it. I actually love it, though. Well, that's the thing. I, I think um, maybe it is a question of, of how you were behavioralized when you were young. And it was a combination of being made afraid of certain things and also rewarded in certain ways. Like... The fact that you were saying, you know, you go to certain places and they say, oh, you're Middle Eastern here. I'll give you a discount or I'll give you some free stuff. Um, to my way of thinking, like what if I said, oh, yeah, I'm a white person. So when I go places, they give me jobs and they give me money and then they give me extra stuff. I mean, it wouldn't sound very good. It, it sounds a bit like, you know, patriarchy and prejudice and racism. So when I hear you saying, you know, oh, I go to these places and they give me stuff, I'm hearing – I benefit from racial bigotry and well, I'm participating in it by both seeing myself that way and letting them see me that way. And for me in those situations, if they tried to give me free stuff or a discount, I would reject it and be unhappy about it. I would be sad for them and I would want no part of it. So I'm going to challenge you and say that's your white perspective. That is your identity showing right now. Because when Middle Eastern people do this with each other, we're doing it because we love each other. We're like, oh, you're me and I'm you. And like, this is beautiful. Like how beautiful that we get to be in the same place together. Like I love your humanity because you would look like me. You look like my mother. You Wait, look, let, yeah. me, let me point out that in the broader economic sense, though, what's happening is that your people are basically saying, yeah, when we see the blacks and the Jews and the whites and, and, and the Indians and, and everyone else, we charge them a lot of money so that we can give you a discount. And that, to me, is prejudice and bigotry and racism, and I don't like it. But it's wrong. You're wrong. Because that only is true if that's happening, right? Like, there are Irish people, white people. They have communities. They obviously, like, love people who are like them. And they might do that with them. It's their own private business. They can do that. They charge, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't understand. Like, there's a difference between doing something out of love and doing something out of maliciousness. What's rape and sex? What are the differences? It's not what's happening. It's why what's happening. It's the context. So it's the same with this situation. You see it that way because you're white. I see it out of love because I know that's what's happening because I'm Middle Eastern and I know how Middle Easterns think. So I'm saying uh, they're thinking out of love I, I, and you're I, I thinking. I hear you justifying bigotry and prejudice. I know because that's your identity and that's your lived experience. And in your bubble, that's probably what's happening with white people. I'm saying white no. people are probably using bigotry 
and this thing and like you know what I'm saying? And I'm saying that's not what's happening in no, these no, no. other No, Because bubbles. what I'm saying is white people, like this is your prejudice showing, in fact. White people have just as much love. So white of people course are they do. looking at white people and saying, Oh, I love white people. They're they're part of my community. I'll give them a discount, I'll give them free money. And but why, I'll, but you know and white I'll Americans that, I'll make it up by charging more to everyone else who's brown. Okay, so that's fine if it's from that perspective. If it's Is from it? the perspective of white uh, non-white people are less than me, so I'll charge them more, that's bigotry. But Middle Eastern people aren't charging white people more necessarily because they're white. They're just charging a f- price. And then if someone's Middle Eastern, they're like, oh, my God, you're like my cousin. Here's 10% off. Yeah, there's no difference between those two things. Th- but there is. Question. No, it's no, just no, no, no. Listen to lot. me right now. Can you explain? No, no. It's just okay. like rape and consensual sex. It is literally the same physicality. The yeah. same physical thing is happening, but the context is different, and that's what changes it. Well, it's a question of what what you tell yourself. No, so not what you tell you. you no, if you, you're doing it right now. You come from a bubble. You have a specific relationship with racial things that I do not have the experience of, though I know some Muslims will at Arabic stores charge white people or not serve them if they feel like they don't like them, which is different than people like giving discounts to people because they feel connected to them. One is bigotry. That's the bigotry that happens at Arabic stores. Absolutely. And I specifically speak like Middle Eastern with my mom a little bit that I know. So they don't discriminate against us when we're in the store. That does happen. But then there's the Middle Eastern people who literally are just doing it out of love. Like love. Like, okay, I go to my mechanic who's Middle Eastern. He doesn't, he didn't charge me last time I went because he knows my parents. And he's like, no, how can I charge you? I didn't do work on your car. I was like, but you inspected it. Charge me. He goes, I can. Bach, go home to your parents. That's just like, that's just him making a decision about losing money in his business because he wants to show like there's a love there. And look, I go to him every time now. It's good business and it makes me feel seen. And it doesn't occur to you, like, I, I feel like you're in denial of the fundamental math, which is the only way he can do that for you is by charging more to other people because he does have to keep his business running. Okay, I charge the same price for everyone in my calls. Sometimes I give people free time. Sometimes I give people free calls. No one gets charged more. Everyone gets charged the amount. I lose money. That's it. I just lose money. Do you? Yes. I, so does- I, I would say that you don't. No, I would say, so- that's wrong though. You're project. No, my dad does this with his business. He loses money to help employees out. He loses money by div- giving discounts. I have relatives who own businesses, gas stations, liquor stores. They all lose money to help their relatives out. It's literally a stereotype amongst our people. That's why I joke we're not rich because we help too many people. It's literally the fact of my experience. Mine only. My bubble. Mine only. So the math so you're running into certain fallacies, at least as I see it. One is the there's always the case where you choose not to charge someone money because they don't have the money. And in that case, you aren't losing money because they weren't going to pay you anyway. Mm-hmm. And if you had tried to ask them for the money, you simply wouldn't have gotten it and they wouldn't have gotten the service. And at that point, it's not that you're doing something where you're taking a loss. You're just choosing to do something, but it doesn't affect your finances at all. You you take no loss. Wait, okay. The, the other is that economically, it is all balanced out. So the credit cards are a fine example for this, I think, I, without going too far afield. Credit card interest rates are charged in order to cover the fact that a certain number of people won't pay their bills, a certain amount of fraud occurs. There's all sorts of people who who misbehave. The people who pay their credit card perfectly well on time, they're, they're fine because they don't pay those high interest rates. But the people who pay a high interest rate pay a much higher interest rate than they really should because they're not only paying what's necessary for them to get that short-term loan from the credit card company, but they're paying for all the people who don't pay their bills at all. They're paying Mm -hmm. to cover all the fraud and theft and stealing. So if you have a credit card and you pay interest, you're not paying the interest that you deserve to pay. You're paying for all the criminals. And just the way that the system works is it takes those costs and distributes them amongst everyone because they can't make the criminals pay. They're not going to pay. They're criminals. And they can't make the people who pay on. Basically, it's just the way that these systems work, the costs get shifted around. Right. So you can can look at it and say, I'm just being given a discount. But the reality is that the the normal price 
has been raised so that you can get that discount. This is what I'm trying to say to you. You are focused on the systems and I'm saying real people in real life where they're not focused on the money will lose money to give people like to show love. I've yeah, seen it in that, front of me. I'm saying that's lying to yourself. No. I'm saying, I'm saying that that's lying to yourself to justify bigotry and racism. That's your whiteness speaking. Well, because maybe that's I'm better than you. No, it's because you were around those people. And I'm saying my experience in, in POC circles or in circles of Middle Eastern people is that out of love, they give and they lose money. Okay. T tell me what the difference is between I love my people and I dislike people who aren't my people. Um, you can love something without disliking someone else. You can dislike someone without loving someone else. You can dislike someone and love someone else. So it just depends on the circumstance. I don't have to hate anyone else to love Middle Eastern people. And if it came to it, like if I had to choose what group to be a part of, obviously the Middle East. Okay, let me put this scenario to you then. Say you have this store where 99% of your customers are other Middle Easterners and you give them all the Middle Eastern price. Well, don't do that, obviously. You won't have any money left. But like and once in one, a while... And then one day some white person comes in and you have to charge them like a whole lot of money compared to what you It's not a whole lot of money. It's just the normal fucking price. But they're it's the, the only, normal the, price. The only person you ever charge is this one white person. No one else that's, ever got that's what I'm saying. Price. Why are you giving an outrageous circumstance to? Why do you take something that's so beautiful and loving and twist it to your dark, dark man mind? Why are you doing that? Because I think that what you consider loving and beautiful, I do consider bigotry. Okay, I disagree because I know the intention of the people who are experiencing those moments because I see it in front of me. It's all beauty. It's all beauty. It's There's nothing malicious about it. They're not thinking some corrupt way about how to like steal from another customer. All they're thinking is, I'm having a great shared moment with someone right now. I'm feeling good about myself. I want to give to other people because that's what good people do. They express love or they shake your hand or if they feel connected to you. That's what I'm saying. Identity allows you to be a part of a community so you can feel love. But it's so it's it's. I forget if we had this discussion here, but it's very much like the the bullying situation where, you know, there's there's some situation where being a bully is a normal part of correcting misbehavior and you're just like teaching someone, hey, and the then way on you another hand, it's cruel, malicious right. torture and, of another person. But, but and, and the the problem is that the the structure of bullying is one where the human being who is most likely to be a cruel person is most likely to become the bully because they like the job. The human being who is most likely to be a bigot and to profit from their bigotry is the person who will drift into that circumstance and charge people they like one price and people they don't like a different price. And it will it will make their, their bigotry look like, oh, I'm just a good member of the community. I just like yes, my people Yes, it could be lot. that way. That's what I'm saying. I'm You're not open and I'm open. Of course it can be that way. I'm just saying it's not always that way. Sometimes it's just beautiful and loving. But sometimes it can be bigotry. It's just not either or. How could it be either or with abeling people on the planet? I think that to strongly view the world through a lens of identity invites tolerance of bigotry. Yes. And so that's why I don't. I don't. Well, it's not, but you do. It, it's just a side effect. You do. By not... You hold bias beliefs. I... You literally hold bias beliefs. So therefore, you hold them because of an informed, like you've been informed by an idea through the lens of your lived experience and what you've observed. You cannot leave the bubble. You can only leave the bubble in your own consciousness, but not when you're interacting with it. Your whiteness plays a role in how other people perceive you. No matter how woke you are or five you are, you still have to interact with the bubbles of the twos who are going to treat you based off your whiteness. So you benefit from whiteness whether you like it or not. And that's just the reality. So then that's we can have a conversation. That's not necessarily true. That, that is fucking true. No, because it <clears throat> could very well be the case and it kind of is the case that I only interact socially with the world through systems that don't involve anyone knowing what color I am. For example, if I buy something off Amazon, no one knows what color I am. I'm not getting any white discount. Um, right. But we also know that statistics, you can look at neighborhoods, you can look like what's the probability of like, if you live in Maine, we can assume you're white. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Unless you're not, which is interesting. 
but like there's an assumption that your location, Amazon decides like what customer base, like all businesses do like, oh, I've noticed I have more customers in this area. Well, who lives in that area? Oh, they're mostly women. They're mostly black. They're mostly Asian. They're mostly white. So like you can say you're anonymous, but like even your voice could most likely will be a white man's voice. Like it's not always the case, but like everything about the way you talk, your lived experience, even when you mention certain details about your life, people can start thinking, oh, you're probably white. Because Keep our identities... But exist in bubbles. To be clear, I'm not talking about other people, but I am saying that I do live my life in a way where if I was remotely close to getting any kind of discount or benefit based on any of my identity characteristics, I would not like that and I would not sure. want any part of it. I guess that makes sense if you don't belong to a community. But communities start up because we want to help people like us. Even the Nazis started up, or like not the Nazis, white supremacists in America currently are doing it because they feel like threatened with their whiteness. So they're like, we have to protect white babies. Okay, they're doing it out of fear. And like, they might have the wrong idea. Like in the same way that black traumatized Americans might have the wrong idea that all white people are the devil. It's like, okay, slow down there, buddy. Your trauma is projecting. White people do the same thing. I'm saying your, but your bubble is different. Every black person has, is not a monolith. Every white person is a monolith. So everyone has a different, you are resentful of it. I see it like the, the like, ickiness in you but like i also in your own life you obviously can operate the way you do because you were raised the way you were like you know how we always talk about like everything everywhere all at once and you don't understand the whole gong gong thing with the grandpa but i understand it and the people who fundamentally grew up with strong identities understand it because we are living that experience right now you have the luxury because of your background and your family of having like a typical white experience where white small family experience where like you aren't beholden to your family Right? Let's just say yes. So it pushes you because of your identity in a direction that I can't go down because of my identity. I don't want to say identity though. See, you're saying identity as if... Cultural background, bubble, no, identity. Just your experience. Let's just mom, try... My mom, no, no, my mom the Brittany, wouldn't... But my the, mom... The way that Brittany's life has turned out is this particular way. And it's not because you're a Muslim. It's not because you're a woman. It's but that's wrong. It was because I was Catholic. Because I grew up queer. Because I was these things. It informed how I saw myself. And then when I was more introspective, I knew that when I was alone in my room, none of these things mattered. But they absolutely fucking matter emotionally when I'm interacting with the bubbles. Because that's how we bond. My, so I do you not want, bond. You want to say that it's because you were Catholic. There are small family Catholics. Right. That would be a different Catholic bubble. So, so, so this is the problem with your identity thing is the moment that you pick at it, you, no. you want to say, oh, that's not really this kind of Catholic. That's that kind of Catholic. But that's so, the difference. There's differences. There's different kinds of poly people, black people, um, religious people. There's all different. There's Orthodox Jews and modern Jews. Like they're different, but they're okay, all. So, so, so here's so here's a. Let me let me show you why I see it this way by inverting it out to another person. You meet Becky. Okay. Becky says to you, "I am a Catholic." Cool. So what that's kind? All Becky says. What are you going to assume about the size of Becky's family? I would ask what kind of Catholic you are. No. The question I would assume. Is, okay. Well, well, here here's the point. Here's my point. Then, you right then are rejecting identity. Because you're basically saying identity no. is worthless to me. I have to find out it's... Becky's actual life experience. No, okay. I get you. But if you live in a bubble, you're informed by the bubble. And then you have to act within accordance to... Women generally have periods. <laughs> my identity informs my expectation of biology. You could say my biology, you know, informs it. But biology informs what you are by your identity, your chromosomes, which identifies what you are. So your, but your problem with this argument is that is no longer identity. That is you. That no, is your experience. But you I am you is a collection of identities. Identity. I'm, an, I, I'm a collection of categories. My shortness, it puts me in a identity. Oh, short girl energy, tall girl energy. Oh, that's a, you know what I mean? Like, do, even, you, do you believe that you could come up with a set of categories that everyone in those categories is exactly like you? What? If if we take people who are Catholics with curly hair 
who are short, who are women, who are, you know, like come up with some long list of categories that you're in. Are you, do you think that everyone who matches all those categories is going to have it, is going to be you? No. That's why identity is useless. That's why identity to me, if you tried to project it onto another person, you would feel this is Are you wrong. monogamous? This is, useless. This is bigotry. Are you monogamous? No. So what are you? You don't like any word that I use for this, so I Because you're attaching yourself to an identity that No, because I no, because I don't I'm not attaching myself to an identity. I just am very casual about the words. That's what you don't like. I don't care what word I use. Well, because you don't think it matters. Right. Okay. So because you don't belong to a community and you don't need it to communicate to the three or four, five, six people in your life, you are not someone who would benefit from identity. But for all of us who are queer or marginalized or minority, or even specifically maybe you're Irish white or specific white where your culture matters to you, okay, it would matter. But it doesn't matter for you. So it doesn't matter. You're just upset. It matters to us. And I don't know why. Well, what I'm saying is that to have your culture matter to you to the degree that you let it either treat your own kind better or treat other people worse, however you wish to like see that, or to the degree that you think it but tells you what to do and how to live your life in a way that might be against what you really want, then I think it is internalized, self-directed prejudice and bigotry. Okay, what's the difference between um, when other people have this happen, I think bad of them when it happens to my someone i love i assume the best of them what's that well that is also bigotry then it's fine to be bigoted because we do choose teams as we should i am bigoted against everyone i chose not to date or marry i think this goes back to the question of judgment versus gay judgment you sure. didn't really judge them. You just said, no, I don't want to get any closer. I don't want to find out more. You didn't say, oh, I've made, I know everything I need to know about this person. I can decide to put them in prison right now. You just said, I'm done gathering information. I'm not going to go down this path anymore. Like okay. there's a, di there's a difference when you see a stranger and they do something you don't like and you think, ooh, icky. Like you don't really know. Okay, hold you're just, up. You're just, you're just having a kind of distant reaction. Yes. And so we make an assessment based off of what we know, and then we move accordingly, and then we move on with our lives. How does this go back to the idea like of identity is just a to you're a man, correct? Yeah. Identity. No, it's categorize just, your cat. No, you cannot. Because just I be. don't I don't choose to do things in my life because they're the things men do. I do things in my life. And then I project out that that's something that men can do. Yes. And that's true, but that's your experience. And I can do that too when I'm alone. I cannot do that when I'm interacting with someone else who lives in a bubble and has an expectation of me. If I'm in a Muslim country, I cannot just be my sex positive self. So it doesn't matter who me is. What matters is what is my identity to how the world is interacting with me. So yes, in the privacy of your home, you get to play the game of, or you get to be introspective enough to say, none of my identities matter. But even in my own marriage, if my partner does not validate or see my identities, I'm going to fucking feel gaslit. Because then they're not seeing me. And me has identities. Brittany has identities. They're just not always the forefront of my action, but they are completely informing my actions. I will openly admit that my womanness 1000% informs my actions. Okay. So let me tie this in then back to love. Cause I said, this was all okay. going to tie in. And so this is where culture comes in maybe. Mm. And maybe this is, maybe this is where you would find that I suddenly start to agree with you or seem to agree with you or something like that. When we were talking about love, the idea was if you love someone, they trust you and you get in this position where you can sort of tell them, this is what you should do. This is how you should behave. This is who you are. And when I'm talking about identity, I'm saying you should reject identity insofar as you shouldn't accept some bigoted prejudice that tells you who you are. You should be yourself. So the question is, oh. mm -hmm. does culture love you and do you love your culture? And can you interact with, with society at large in a way that is loving or receives love and therefore gives permission to society or culture to inform you as to who you are and who you should be. So in other words, 
can you well I'll say that I'll, I'll say one thing right away that I think is a negative just because you love society I don't think means that you get to tell society what to do any more than if you love a person you get to tell them what to do they have to love you to give you permission to to, to change them you loving them is incidental yeah. so but I do think that if you have a society that loves its members, then it's perfectly reasonable for those people to look at it and say, this is a loving society, much like you would to a family. This is a loving family. This is something that has my best interest at heart. They want to teach me English. They, they want to teach me how to count. They want to teach me whatever. They want me to have certain values and things that are, that are going to help my life progress well. And I can, I don't have to, but I can grant this culture and society permission to tell me who I should be, who I should become. I think that's all true. I think when you talk about community, you're talking about giving a group of people permission to help you become someone, but I think you have to want also to become that someone. I think that if a community tries to tell you to become someone and it's not who you are, you don't have to, and right. this is, I guess, what I'm saying with identity, you don't have to ever say, oh, but I am one of well, these of people, therefore I have to be in this bubble, but I have to think of myself in this bubble. You have permission to reject it. Yes, except if you want to be a part of the group. So that's the difference. I don't want to tell people to live any which way. I don't care. You are trying to inform people that, you know, there's a better way. And I'm saying there is no better way. Unless you don't better. want to be a part of the group. I'm not saying better. I think better for some people. Just like I said, right. most people are kind of stable and want to be where they are. Right. I think most people want to be told what to do. And they okay. want the community to help them out. I think, I think the biggest questions that we have at many points in life are, who am I? And usually the answer to that is, well, you're one of us. And then the next question is, well, who the hell are we? Yeah. And, and, and then you've got to find some way to answer those questions. And I think the community can provide an answer. But I think many answers go back to who am I? Many answers go back to the individual purely. Unless you're part of a community. <laughs> well, well, it's always, it's always a, a group, but yeah. But here's the problem. So if you asked my father, who is he? He'd be like, I'm a Catholic. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm an engineer. Always in that order. My whole fucking life. God first. I'm a Catholic first. Always. In if you ask my farm brother, what are you? Catholic first. Always. Always. There is no me. Because I am nothing without God. Mm -hmm. Versus Brittany goes, well, there is no God. So what am I? Woman? Because for me, I don't understand who I am except that I'm a woman. Because everything I've ever experienced in my life was through the lens of female. How I was treated as a woman. How I was raped as a woman. How I was given jobs as a woman. How I was trained as a woman. My father thought I was a lesbian because he taught me how to run a business. And he raised me as a boy. He literally said to me, because I raised you like a boy, so he wasn't treating me like a Britney who's a female. He was treating me like a daughter he wanted to be a boy, which is fine. I learned a lot about my life, which is moving in my masculine, right? But, but well, okay, so I like the idea of you basing this in woman because for me, and not to go way too often to the controversial lands, but... But that is a fundamental aspect of reality. Like we, we can look at you on OnlyFans and we can know that you're a woman. Um, we, I don't necessarily think that the idea that you were taught how to run a business would make you a boy. I mean, just hearing that, that expressed sounds to me as crazy. But it's not crazy because you know the history of the world and how it's run. I, I know. I, 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 it, it's. I understand how people could say it and things like that. I'm just saying that to my frame of understanding the world, if I ever saw a woman running a business, I would not walk up to her and say, well, good day, sir. I mean, it's, just, it's laughable. But you know, but there are bubbles of men, like women in men's industries. The woman is considered more awesome if she can make it in a boy's industry because the job is something only boys usually handle. Uh, that's, that's, it's not a way that I think. Like, there's a, I, there's no, no, a lot stop. of stuff Wait, you could Wait, I just want to clarify. I need to clarify. I know it's not the way you think. Yeah, yeah. I'm asking you if you know it's the way the reality is for other people. Therefore, when your identity is different, you have to operate within the mechanism of the two bubble you're interacting with. 
I'm not asking what you're doing in your personal home where you're safe and away from the world. So this might be a point. I don't necessarily think that when I interact with a bubble that isn't mine, that that I get into it in that same way. I feel often more like, like I have sort of a distance. Like if I go to a foreign country and I don't speak the language, I don't suddenly just learn the language and interact with them like a native. I just make weird hand gestures and hope for the best. I feel like often when I'm interacting with these bubbles, if they're very much unlike me, I don't make that great an effort to get inside their mind. Like mm. some, like, you know, because I'm psychologically interested, sure, I, I read a book, I watched a movie, I, I sort of think I understand. But there's a lot of stuff that I see people do where I'm just like, I want no part of that. Yeah, and, but they're probably and, and twos, I'll make right? I'll gestures and I'll leave. But are they like, okay, so there's the twos who live by the script of their community. So when I ask people, like, what kind of Catholic are you? I'm trying to ask what kind of script they follow their life through. Because if yeah. you're a Roman Catholic, you're just, you, you're specifically different than Orthodox, okay? And so it's fine. It's all fine. But I'm asking, so, because they're usually proud to know their identities. And they're usually proud to tell me, I, this is my identity. Treat me according to my identity. So that's no problem. I can do that. Like, that's great. If people feel more comfortable with that, which it seems like the world does, I'm great with that. I feel that comfortable too. When I'm in gay circles, I want to be treated like a gay person. One of them, not a straight girl. Just because I'm dating a man and I look like I'm straight presenting. I want to be, I want to make sure that I'm not alienated from my gay communities just because I'm sucking dick. You know but, what I mean? But what about when you're, so let's put you in communities that that you're not a member of. Like if, okay. if you went if you went to the KKK, like, would you be like, hey, where's the black people to round up? I mean, you, are you going to try, try to blend into their group? No, but I don't have share an identity with them. But, we don't but have a shared identity. Is, so, so, so you don't share an identity with them. But I'm just saying, so, so what if you had to interact with them as a bubble? Well, then I'd interact with them as like a, I'd have to go down to like we're humans. Hi, what's up, human? We're That's where I am with almost all bubbles. Where I am okay. with almost all bubbles is, hi, you're a human. I'm going to interact with you at that le level and probably not any further. Even if they're like me, I, I, I don't care how white male they are. But that makes sense because you're not trying to form an identity. You're a lone wolf in much more of a way than I am. I like my communities. I like identifying with my communities. But I don't like saying, as gay people, we should be like this. That's like too monolithic, right? I would like to say, well, generally speaking, in this gay bubble, we're like this. Yeah, I would say that, that my sense of desire for community at an early age was formed to be basically none. That's and that my, my distrust of communities was formed to be enormous. And possibly, like you might be onto something if you say that that's a kind of white thing because white people a lot haven't of them been I know. that pretty in history. Well, and a lot uh, of them I know don't hold like community very important to them unless it's through their whiteness or through like a bowling or Catholicism, right? But then that's not about their whiteness. That's about their religion. Yeah. I, I, I don't have any problem looking at the general white European culture and saying, this has been a bunch of people who are assholes to each other. This has been the people who have started most of the big wars and have tortured most of the people and have, have just been terrible. And so not wanting to be one of them seems fairly reasonable. Distrusting communities and organizations seems fairly reasonable, but in no way, shape or form did I ever think, oh, it's just purely white people and all the black people and brown people and yellow people and whatever, their communities must be the best. They must all be no, peaceful and too. harmonious and in love with each other and perfect. <laughs> right, right. No, I, I think they've got to be the same or worse. Yeah, they're the same for sure and sometimes worse depending on how you do it. The thing is like it's kind of like – it's like in my family when someone commits like – let's say an atrocious moral issue like problem or crime or something. I'm going to be like, what the fuck, bro? But let's – solve it in our community because other people are not going to like, I don't talk about the stuff my parents and I went through a lot because the way white people react to it is so over dramatic for me. I can't handle it. It's just too dramatic. So I listen to a lot of POC podcasts and they'll talk about like the abuse we handled as like growing up with immigrant parents. And it's like, we want to be able to talk about it without needing to like talk about like validate me. Yeah. That was a shitty thing my parents did, but like, don't then say like somebody wrote a comment on my video the other day, like, what did she say? Something about like, I can't believe you survived that like psychological violence. And I was like, ooh, that feels so dramatic. Mm -hmm. Like it's accurate though. It was psychological violence, but it wasn't on the spectrum of I'm being locked in a room and like only talk to in dog sounds. 
So when I, so I have the issue of being a strong woman trope, which means I want to deny any harm that's ever been done to me to such a degree where I'm like, it's all fine. My rape was fine. My parents hitting me was fine. Everything was fine. But that's not true. So I needed the validation of my hardcore SJW groups to be like, yeah, you're like your identity as a woman, your identity as a rape victim, your identity as an abused. I needed to own those identities and be like, I was an abuse victim. So I could then go, eh, I'm over it. But I couldn't actually get over it until I fully embraced the fact that I was abused. Yeah, yeah. Right? Now- well, it's, it's this classic psychological thing of you have to see the shadow, accept the shadow, own the shadow, but right. you don't have to become the shadow. Right. That's how I see my identities though. And then I like to visit my communities because I think no matter how like separate from my identities I'll be in my own home, like I'm not like, you know, even in my own home, I would just like to be a consciousness with another consciousness separate from my identities. I still in my own home do like certain identities to be explored through the lens of those identities because it adds it's kind of like role playing or LARPing, but with something that's like ingrained in my DNA. So I really like identities because it's so obviously clear that like they bring me joy. And I like being a part of a group. What do you think of um, sort of that voyeuristic desire to look at other identities? Like, not necessarily the clan, obviously, but, you know, just some some identity out there that you think you're, is fairly neutral or fairly positive, but you're in no way, shape, or form a member. Like, let's just say the Japanese. They're fun. They're pretty. They're cool. They make anime. All the stuff that you like. Um, you're clearly not Japanese. Mm. Would your approach to the Japanese community be what? Like if I was to interact with them? Yeah, yeah, in some way. Or, or just how you would desire to interact with them. Um, I would be, I have thought about this because I want to go to Japan. I think I would be myself, but like 90% diluted. So, so, well, I guess part of like what I might be asking is, would you want to try to become Japanese? Oh, no. Would, would you want to try... Like, to what degree would you want to experience things Japanese people experience versus what degree would you want to just see the Japanese people doing it? Like, going to a temple or, or, you know, just doing anything that you think is a Japanese thing. Would you want to see them do it or would you want to do it? Um, I know when I went to Belize, I tried to go to, like, mom and pop shops and, like, hole-in-the-wall places versus the tourist places. Because I wanted, like, an authentic experience of, like, what everyday people were existing as. And um, newsflash, it's the same as anywhere else. They're all kind of doing their thing. The food's different. The music's different. The atmosphere's different. But people are people are everywhere, right? But they're, that difference is where the identity meets the we're all the same. And that difference, which is why I love identity, allows a new – oh, going back to what you said earlier, that new adventure. So instead of traveling, I just meet new people and they tell me their identities. And through their identities, I get to now have a new experience. I think the uh, it just occurred to me, and maybe this is obvious, but what you get through this whole community and identity thing is something that I tend to get more from movies and stories. Ah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, actually, wait, that does make sense because that's the same thing. I see the reason I love watching movies with you is because it feels like I'm bubble hopping, but without the satisfaction of actually just talking to people. So then I get frustrated, I think, with movies. Maybe that's why I'm off movies right now. And I'm just like, nope, somebody talk to me. I want to talk to people. It's because I'm getting a real life answer and real life moment to my energy. But in a movie, it's just them. And I don't get to actually like, I just get to imagine what it's like if I'm there. I don't actually get to, hey, can I interrupt this film? My hmm. name is Brittany. <laughs> so maybe that's it. I do. I mean, that's why my job is what my job is, right? Like I, the thrill of talking to a new person, I'm like, what are they going to tell me today? Without me having to leave my house or get in an airplane. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think from my side, um, while I know superficially it, it must sound um, not as good to read a book or watch a movie as to be in a place with a person, but I do feel like there is something to be said for the idea of interacting with a produced cultural artifact mm. that uh, maybe has made its way to me because lots of people think that it's good. Lots of people think that it's valuable. People, you know, certainly made it. They could have destroyed it the five minutes after they made it if they didn't like it. Yeah. Whereas if I meet, if I meet a person, like say I go to Belize and I go to a little shop, maybe I'll meet a drunk person and I'll think all these Belize people are drunk. Like yeah. I, I, I'm going to be prone to making decisions that might be very true about a particular person or my limited experience. 
but I feel like I can maybe get a better feel for a culture by looking at cultural artifacts than by even the living people. Okay, so there's the difference between you and most people, um, especially Americans. They don't watch a lot of foreign films like you do. You watch literal documentaries made in certain countries, literal movies made in certain countries for their people. So you are bubble hopping through movies in a way that most Americans can't because most of our films are made by white people about people of color or about <laughs> foreign people. So we don't get an authentic, like telling of their story, but you're watching things that are telling the authentic story. So you would get that. But also you're quite world traveled, sir. Like you, you kind of, you know what I'm saying? So you have a lot of tools under your belt that the average person is just not going to have. So if you're just on Twitter, the greatest, quickest shortcut to doing this is like bubble hopping through identity. And identity is polarized and it's very like, you're not black enough. You're not white enough. You're not Middle Eastern enough. So there's like a, a horrible, disgusting, just bigoted side of identity that I absolutely agree with you that is trash and worthless. But I'm just trying to, I think, be optimistic and focus on the positives. Like, if you ask my parents, this is so typical, like, who's the worst ethnicity? They're like Middle Eastern people. Who's the best <laughs> Middle Eastern people? The best and worst is our own people because we are yeah. the best and worst. When there's drama in our communities, we want us to handle it because we understand each other. But also, how could we do this to our own communities? Well, I, so I would say that Every community would probably say that it's because you know them the best. Yeah. You see, you see them from the inside. You see them at the worst. You see them at their best. Yeah, yeah. It's like a weird. That's why identity is so complicated, though. I think there's like a very important. You said this earlier about my need to validate people. I do think it is so important to validate, validate, validate. Okay, now we're all good. Great. Now solution time, which means you have to move out of your identity. So in order to become like a five and be introspective, I had to ask myself, well, who was I outside of everything the world told me I was? And the closest route I got down to was woman, though it, it's really a human woman, because I just cannot escape the fact that I'm a woman. I just can't yeah. do it. No matter how hard I try, I just like I'm currently spotting because I have this birth control and I'm just sitting here thinking, fuck me. And that's not something that most men can have an experience of unless they're trans. And in that case, y'all are cheating. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. a cheat. It's not the same. So it's like, cool, I love that. But like, you know what I'm saying? So I agree with you that there is a horrible side to identity. And it is the bigotry or the, um, in order to boost my group up, I have to boost this group down like or like, you know, tear them down. That's bullshit. And I'm saying either be optimistic about your identities or like be honest. But then I have to interact with all these bubbles and I – have to interact with the reality of the world. And the reality of the world is that I get treated differently because I'm a woman sometimes. So I have to just be aware of that. Like I can't pretend that I'm, even when I'm in my masculine, you know, they might just like, sometimes it works though. Sometimes with men, it genuinely changes how they treat me if I go into my masculine. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's also a protective like defense mechanism, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. there's definitely that, uh, that very hard to explain effect with some people you look at them and you just think, I don't want to mess with this person. Like, I don't know why, but I know that it's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's interesting. Cause people will tell me like, Oh, Brittany, you're so intimidating. I'm like, but in other circles, people are like, Brittany, you're the least intimidating person I've ever met. So it's like, what does that mean? They're seeing different sides of me. Mm -hmm. They also have to interact with different sides of me. So it's like, it's, it's hard to know, but I also think we're all those things at once. Like you said, going back to that, I do think no matter who I am, which version of myself, I'm always all of myself. I'm just if asking part of myself to be more on the surface. Yeah. That's all I'm asking because it's like a better tool. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the way I like to think of it. But it's all available to me and I can, I can mix and match and, and do what I need. Like right. if I need to wear a dress, I, I think of myself, I'm a guy in a dress. I do not think I'm a fake girl or, or I'm a girl or like I, I don't go down a path of being in my feminine if I'm cooking I think I'm a guy who can cook right okay so I don't know if it's the gay in me or the gender fluidity or something but like um it feels like a it does feel like um performative larping but with like an emotional attachment so when I'm doing BDSM like I can tell the difference between people who are like I'm a dom <laughs> and I'm like okay <laughs> and then people who are like yeah I'm a dom and I'm like okay and then there's people who are like, oh, I'm a dom. Like all of them are doms, but not mm -hmm. all of them are spiritual doms or LARPing doms to the point where I'm like, you're not playing pretend enough for me to believe you or you're not invoking some sort of spiritual connection with this. So it just feels like you're some guy off like Craigslist who's looking for feet pics. Like it doesn't feel like it, it correlates with an identity or a like when I choose my play partners, like I'm choosing people who evoke identities so strongly that it's like 
I'm not even doubting it in this moment. So when I'm like in my boy feelings, when I feel like I'm a boy, when I'm dressed like a boy, when my hair is up and I'm feeling very masculine and all of a sudden I'm like spreading my legs and my hands on my crotch because that's like what I think of as a man. Like I'm experiencing this thing. I'll do it automatically because I'm in that energy. But I am in some ways evoking the memory of what I know a man is to me and then encompassing it in my language. I am not literally a man. Hmm. But it is so ref- like instinct almost like it's just moving off the energy that it feels stronger than a girl pretending to be a guy it's like the difference between girls who eat pussy and girls who are gay different yeah, energies it, it feels to me like it's um it, it's a bit like method acting mm. it's it, it's not that it is exactly like method acting but it's equivalent insofar as it's a tool that an actor uses to get into the role i feel like the but it's not separate from myself some people right, it right. is yeah yeah, but it's 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 maybe you imagine a certain shape and mm. you try to be that shape, and and it just it's a tool, but it's still you doing it, just like it's still the actor doing it. But to be clear, and I think this is something that's very hard to explain to some people, so like stick be bear with me. When I'm on stage and I'm thinking of like the drag queens, they're like bringing something from within themselves and pulling it out. Mm-hmm. A method actor is taking something and becoming that thing. No, uh, well. That, that no they're really not like they're, they're in their mind sort of trying to pretend to but we all know that they're really not they're, they're still the themselves thing. The f- but it's not so there are people i meet at the dungeon who pretend to be doms and submissives they play the role they're larping mm-hmm. i see it then there are people like me who psychologically feel like the catholics do or the muslims do mm-hmm. strongly that thing where it's a part of me and then I evoke that tool I have growing up to being a part. That's why so many BDSMers were former religious kids. And the ones that I hang out with were people who had connections very strongly to like gender fluidity and expression because it's something like almost in them versus like the performative non-binary people that I see sometimes. I'm like, eh, that feels more like method acting than a real spiritual experience you're having with your gender, which I do think is real. Mm-hmm. I actually do believe in the spiritual relationship with your emotional intuitive side that brings out these identities. And then I believe there are people who just happen to be doms because they buy the the restraints or floggers. But it's not the same as what I feel like I'm experiencing. And I, with those people in my actually can't get together because we're not having the same experience. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that distinction, that line, wherever it is or whatever it is, it's like... Like, okay, I know people I meet, and I'm like, I know you've never been to a dungeon, but you were 100% BDSM. And they're like, really? I was like, I, it's everything you're saying, everything you're doing, the way you're acting, the way you're interacting, 100% BDSM. They're like, oh, I never thought about that. But then people I meet who are at the dungeon, I'm just like, why are you here? You're not BDSM. They're like, yes, I am. I do everything that makes me BDSM. And they're the people who usually don't stay at the dungeon for more than a few months. Cool. Or, Th- thank you for proving the uselessness of identity now. Well, that's the thing, though. <laughs> Is it like identity because you do it or is identity because you feel it? I, it's because I feel it or because I am. But like I can't be white in the in the like Nazi way. That's why it feels like gaslighting to me when people tell me I could be a Nazi. Because I'm like, that's like saying I could be a man. I cannot be these things. I can only bring out the energy within me that is masculinity, that is not being a man. But the masculinity comes out in the form of what is performatively a man. But the masculinity is within my womanhood. Because women can be masculine. But they cannot. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Okay. I, I guess my point is like just as someone could be BDSM without knowing that they're BDSM and maybe they've like, I don't know, maybe they've never done anything, but you can sense it in them. And once you tell them about it, they're like, yes, this is me. And you're right about it. But they wouldn't have thought that was part of their identity. Like right. there, there's there's always some potential like um, this is going to sound goofy and it's not true, but there's some potential that you would go to Japan and the Japanese would be like, you are Japanese. You're one of us. And you, you're like, I never really thought about it. But you're right. And suddenly you blend in, you fit in, and everything fits. Like, it's possible that it's possible that your identity isn't necessarily what you think it is. And that, that, it's, all, that it's all a bit more confusing. And, and I try, part of why I resist it is I try not to get pigeonholed and not to get locked into things. And to be more open to the fact that, oh, I might be a member of a group that I don't know I'm a member of. Totally. Now, I think that's the thing, the difference between what are, are you what you look like you're doing or is it what you feel like you're doing? So, like, you know, like if you're like a Catholic who's pretending not to be a Catholic so you don't get like killed. 
Okay. It's like you are still a Catholic, even if the world doesn't decide you're a Catholic because you know in your heart you're a Catholic. So for me, your identity is two things. It's how you see yourself, how you that interacts with the world, or I guess three things, and then how the world interacts with you and perceives you, right? So it's like your identity is all of these things. Like I get told all the time who I am by people and you're all wrong. But like that's the thing is like they're not obligated to actually have the right answer and I'm not obligated to care about their wrong answer. Yeah, As long language. as their perception of me doesn't get me hung, killed, yeah. raped just because or jailed or something or fired. Yeah, it's a language thing. Like when, when you start to use labels like Catholic or feminist is mm. probably the best one. What does that even mean? Who like knows? we don't know. No one can say I'm a feminist and have any any what idea kind? of what, what someone meant. Uh, so it's almost a useless word, but it's also not a useless word. Right. So the person who's saying it, they know what they mean by it, and it's important to say it, even if no one understands. And, right, right. and and I can appreciate that. I think for me, it defaults back more to just the personal identity as right, being right. the the easiest expression of that. That. Like if you say, you know, I'm a Brittany, I know what you're saying. You you don't have to use labels that are confusing. You don't have to use this or that. I I, I, I know that you are this thing that has been shaped by your life experience. And that's how I prefer to think of you. I think that's fine. But you know how you can't see all the parts of me? I can't see them the way that you see them. No, you but cannot I can see, see them, them the way that I see them. But you can't see them if you don't know they exist. Well, yeah, there's stuff you don't show. Right. So I'm saying because you wouldn't be able to see, well, I always joke that I've shown everyone everything, but they just don't see it. Like, that's the thing. You can't see something you don't understand or identify or even like, it's just like, it's going to look like a, just like a cloud in the sky. It's all going to look the same. Mm -hmm. But if you know what your cloud looks like, you're gonna be like, that's my cloud though. That's what I've been trying to do my whole life is like signal to the people like who I am and that the right people will find me. And I think everyone, this is what I'm trying to say about my life. My life has made it. So everyone in my inner circle only sees parts of me, but they see enough of me that we were obviously like, I think I was meant to meet you. And I was meant to be your friend and you were meant to be in my inner circle. And I think like that means you're a soulmate and to some extent, right? Because out of all the people in the universe, like I was like, oh, this one. And like, mm -hmm. this one's a great one and I want to keep him and I want to be good to him and stuff. But when we have those moments where we can't see each other or we're disconnecting, it can feel like almost scary. Yeah. I think right? it's because we, we let language get in the way where we didn't need the language. Like, there, like I obviously don't see everything about you, but I'm sure that there are things about you that I see that I can't ever put into words. Mm. And even if I did put them into words, they wouldn't be the words that would make sense to you. Yes. So I, so that's the thing though. Cause like now that I'm partnered, I, and now that I find that this person, like, I feel like this person, I just say it. And we don't have these, like, we even if we have, like, a disconnect for a second, it's, like, 2.5 seconds. But you and I have longer disconnects because I think you can't see those parts of me. Yeah. And I can't and, see them in you. One of the things that I would put out there, though, is it would be an interesting and probably difficult philosophical question as to how much of that is because of that person seeing you well and how much of it is because of generosity on your part to make the most generous interpretations of what they say as seeing you. I mean... I'm me everywhere. So like, I've definitely been like, what does that mean? What does that fucking mean? What does it mean? What are you saying? And then they'll look at me and they'll clarify. I'm like, <laughs> so like in the dating process of getting to know this person, I have to assume they're not going to see me. Yeah. Right. So and, like and I, in that process, you're teaching them to see you because every time they slightly deviate, you're letting them know you're slightly deviating. Uh, not correct. all the time. So that's the thing. I need to do that the least amount with this person hmm. compared to everyone else. Well, but I'm saying that um, the very fact that you – I'm sort of saying that when you are close to someone like that, you are – in addition to making people a better person, you're making them a better partner. So you're yes. teaching them you. You're teaching them – you're opening yourself up and you're saying, here's my levers and knobs. Here's what to pull. Here's what yes. to push. When you do this, you're going to get a bad reaction. It's your choice as to whether or not you do it again. That's the thing. So because of who they are – they, because they have the tools or their life has given them the tools to be the person they are, to see parts of me, to be open to even hearing those things. Mm -hmm. They make the right decisions. Yeah. With form, former partners, because they were, their life made them into people who couldn't see every part of me, they made the wrong decisions. Because even after I explained it to them, they were just like, don't get it, don't see it, don't understand it. In the same way that you and I, like I have a romanticized version of identity 
because I went through the trauma of radically accepting that it was poisonous. Then I put it to the side and now I can only love it because now I get to experience all the good stuff and I vomited out all the bad stuff I hated about identity politics. Mm. So I feel like I get the fun stuff of it, like calling my sister and be like, girls weekend. What's a girls? Oh, can you hear me? You can't hear me. Testing, testing, no. testing. Okay. Oh, fuck. That monologue was fire. Okay. Basically, when I have a girls weekend with my sister, we're not having a boys weekend. We're having a girls weekend. That's our identity as sisters and girls facilitating a assumed event that will take place. Lots of, ah, lots of, oh, lots of, you know, girl stuff. Lots of like, you know, and that's like, a that's what I'm saying. Identity for me, I get all the good stuff of identity now. Mm -hmm. So when I say a girl's weekend, it's not because I'm rejecting the, my husband. Oh, gross. My husband. Girl's weekend. I'm like, I love you so much. Stay in the hotel while I have a girl's weekend because <laughs> he might want to be with me all the time. Whatever he wants. You know what I mean? But I'm not doing it because I'm rejecting him. I'm doing it because my sister wants to facilitate an energy. And if he is there, how are we going to have a girl's weekend? Okay. You have perfectly segued into maybe the last thing that I wanted to say, which is uh, I think this came up in, in your video about love. But – it might have been just something from near there. There's this notion of when you find someone that they're like your person, your special one and so forth. And I think you might have used the language or I've just heard it other places of like, you're my everything. Mm. And I think that we push back against that because we obviously don't, we can sense that it's wrong to say, oh, you're my everything. That means you have to provide every need that I have. Yeah. You have to de give me everything that I want and you have to be everything for me. What I think we really mean by that is closer to you are the measuring system, the metric by which I will use my own values to judge everything in existence. So you are so important to me that my values come from you and flow through you and therefore if I need something else, like, you know, I need a night with the girls, I'm going to judge how much I need that through the lens of how it's going to impact our relationship. Yes. And if it would destroy our relationship, I don't fucking need that night with yes. the girls. If it, if it doesn't hurt our relationship, then yeah, I do need the night with the girls. Yes. Yes. Only if within reason, it has like a really, it has to be within a reason, right? So but you there's- wouldn't, You wouldn't pick a person that it wasn't reasonable with, hopefully. You, mm, hopefully. So that's the difference is people are going to hear this and they're going to hear a toxic boyfriend or girlfriend yeah. who never lets their partner leave the house and yeah. alienates them from their friends versus my parents who literally just love being together at all times. Like literally my dad goes on business trips. My mom goes with him. He has like if they have like a – but that's not true because my mom has girls weeks with her sisters and they go to Catholic events just by themselves and the husbands don't go. Hmm. But I, that's what I was saying. Like one person can't provide everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they can't. They can provide the measure by which you value things in your life. Yeah. Like, do I value traveling around the world? Depends on what my partner wants. Totally. Do 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 I value? Yeah, like I don't know. Having a clean house depends on what my partner wants. Well, wait a second. Does that go back to the? Um, well, it's not kind of putting your identity now in your partner. Like, because you wanna you wanna have like a partner. Yes, I understand that. Okay, so this is. You're saying this past the point of doing the basics of negotiation and agreeing to be partners. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm ignoring all bad relationships sometimes okay. when I talk. Okay, okay. Because obviously I agree. Because I do want to be in a relationship where I, you know, when I do things, I consider my partner first. Obviously me first, but them first. But they are me and so it's, that's first. So like I would say like, hey, how does this impact like our finances? Because it's not just uh, me anymore. Even my own health, I treat better when I'm in a partnership. Because it's not just me anymore. Yeah. You know, there's something. Exactly. exactly. That's a perfect exactly. example. Like, how do I how do I treat exercise and diet and all these other things? Even though it's still just me, it's not just me. It's not just me. Which goes back to when you love someone, you're giving them permission to help you be a better person. Yeah. And that's what's happening. So instead of fighting my partner, you know, you hear those stories about partners who like won't lose weight or won't get healthy for their partners. And they're like, this person's just trying to control me. It's like, they're trying to keep you from dying at 40, you fucking idiot. <laughs> and like, the problem is, is like, they don't love themselves or their partner enough to stay alive. And that's interesting. Because that also coincides, I think, with how we look at like mental health and everything. Not everything's in our control all the time. Like we have problems with addiction and food consumption. But for me, it's easier for me to face my demons when I know someone's depending on me to do it. 
And when I know I want to have a child, I think about how that child is going to benefit from me tackling my demons before having them if I can. And my mm-hmm. life has allowed me that opportunity, which I think is like a blessing, right? Um, some parents have to figure it out as they're having the babies and that's that's just their story, like my parents. Um, so that's, you know what I mean? So like I think like that's the part about relationships that confuses me. I think a lot of people are just cohabitating because they're lonely though. And so they're not thinking about love making them better or the, the value of love or the honor of love. They're just thinking about the lack of being alone, which is not the same. Yeah. No, you I know? think there's there's definitely a case where there's a lot of bad relationships. And often when I talk about these things, I don't think about the ways that they can go wrong. Okay. Like w- w- when I talk about, you know, a non-monogamous relationship, I'm never thinking about all the terrible, bad, awful poly relationships. I think about that about as much as if I'm talking about sex, I think about well, you know, young teenagers having bad sex. Who cares about that? That's not the way that life works. Well, wait a second. At the beginning of the conversation, you were talking about how things can go wrong because you're learning and you're going to make mistakes like buying a fur coat when you don't have the money. Yeah, yeah but uh, what I'm saying – Those there, are bad relationships. E- even with – no. Those are the beginnings of good relationships. The beginnings of good relationships still have problems. Like just because okay. you find the right person doesn't mean everything is perfect out of the box. But the right person is the person with whom you will grow and learn and, and – and un- yeah, but what work. does that mean when it gets down to it? If you have a person you're really in love with and they serial cheat on you, that's a bad relationship. If, it, but, yeah, if that's truly what it is, yeah. But that's – what's the – okay. So that part is where everyone gets to decide, oh, my husband hits me every night and, yeah, I'm bloody and blue, but it's a good relationship. And it might be. It's I'm not – okay, that's your business, bitch. But mm-mm. like to me, that's never – okay. Right? And neither is serial cheating. So it is always what it is. If they are serial cheating, if they're hitting their wives, that is always what it is. And But it's up to the people in the relationship to be in that. Well, it raises the question of – so there's the two questions of redemption mm. and whether or not someone can be redeemed in a relationship that currently exists. That's like, up to the people in it, right? Yes. The, the the version of the story that we most often see is, you know, someone's in a bad relationship, they leave it, they learn their lesson, and they start a new relationship, and this time they don't make mistakes. Like, mm-hmm. that's sort of the, the prototypical story. Yeah. We don't so often see someone's in a bad relationship, they decide to fix themselves, and their relationship gets better. And there's lots of reasons for that. Psychologically, when you're in a certain place and with a certain person – they tend to reinforce all sorts of patterns. And if you have bad patterns, they reinforce bad patterns. It's it's hard to become that good relationship or that good person while you're around the person who led you into or was part of you forming or it, around a bad relationship. Like it's just, it's harder. I don't think it's impossible. So right. I do think that you could go from that relationship with a serial cheater out of the serial cheating. Like yes. I think that could go from bad relationship to good relationship, but it's harder. Yes. And it's the the more but, but it might be that that's also necessary cuz there's a aspect of the relationships which is if you just look at someone and say, "Well, this is bad and this is hard and this is difficult. I'm going to abandon this." Mm. And therefore I'm going to go get myself from redemption and be a better person and start a new relationship. You can form that other cycle which is just when the going gets tough, I abandon people and and then I yeah. just find someone new. And you never fix the problems anyway. I know like really good people who have a very hard time in their own personal journey um, with like commitment, let's say. And I look at them and I think, hey, I love you, but bro, keep it in your pants. And they're just like, I can't, bro, I can't. And I'm like, okay, then you're on a journey where you're going to serial cheat and you're going to hurt the people that love you. And they're like, I know, bro, I know, but I just like, I, I don't have the balance, okay? I can see that person and know they're in a moment of time where they're doing pretty bad things and shitty things to the people around them. But I also know they're not actually trying to maliciously torture their loved ones. Mm -hmm. So I can see the potentiality for healing, which will allow them to apologize, which will allow them to live a future where everyone understands they were going through a moment, right? And that's fine. But then there are the people who act with such malicious, indifferent behavior, and they never leave that moment. And so for the moment of their literal existence, they're just a constant... No redemption. There's just no redemption. And those are the differences, right? It's not the action. Like, it's not, oh, every serial cheater is never going to be, like, a committed person. It's just that, which journey are they on? Mm -hmm. How long is this moment going to last? So that's what I usually, like, in my inner circle, when we are, like, when someone's doing something that I really, really, really just, like, this is not good. 
You know what I mean? It's the question is, is this a moment in your life or a moment in time? And if I see some sort of permanent energy to it, then I tell them I'm going to treat you permanently like this until you change. But for now, there's no reason for me to think next week you're going to be different like I've done because I would I usually do that for years and years and years. I usually give everyone the benefit of the doubt that it's going to stop. And if it doesn't stop after like a few years, I kind of go, okay, it's been three, four, five years. I appreciate this. Like, and I give, that's a lot of fucking time to be patient with people, in my opinion. And I usually wait because in my line of work, I get to see people who do calls with me for up to a year change sometimes within three months, sometimes six months, sometimes nine months. Sometimes the change doesn't happen till the 11th month. Yeah. And then they're like, boop. And then sometimes it doesn't even happen and they stop doing calls with me and they never get better. And I see them sometimes and I'm like, oh, they didn't change, but that's okay. They're just in this moment. They're stuck in it. So I think that's the difference. And then with my inner circle, obviously I have unconditional love for even the people who are stuck in their bad moments because I love them. It's already done. What am I going to do? Eh, I'll visit them in prison, I guess. (laughs) But other, you know what I'm saying? So for me, I think that love makes me better. Funny enough, even though they're in a committed bad moment, I am so unconditional with my love towards them that they always have access to me just in a specific way. So they can't show up to my front door. That make me, me feel nervous, like they're going to kill me. But they can call me and we can meet for dinner. You know what I mean? Because if they showed up at my front door right now after I already told them they're not allowed, that's a threat. Yeah. Even though I unconditionally love them, but I know they're a little unstable. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I also have to be like, hey, I love you. What are you doing at my house? <laughs> Versus, you know what I'm saying? So I, and I would not call the cops on them, right? Because I'm like, hey, I don't want to get a third party involved in our business. But if they were like a non inner circle person and I just knew them, I'd be like, hey, girl, I'm gonna call the cops in 10, 9, 8, 7. Because you were not inner circle. I do not owe you loyalty for showing up to my door. So that's like, ironically enough, the love makes me better. And it's, I am giving them permission to make me better because I unconditionally love like certain people. I am giving them permission to make me more patient. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's just another form of exercise sometimes of you're testing my patience it's kind of good for me to have my patients tested sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. I think that's what's like ultimately beautiful beautiful about all of this, but because we're all so different because of our identities, we go through life with certain tools that are given to us either by our bubble or not by our bubble. Like, I have to explain to my brothers how to scrub a toilet one more time. What products to use? What chemicals to use in the sink? I'm gonna fucking shoot myself. But why would they know that when they were not, they were raised doing construction outside? Thank God I'm also not told, hey, Brittany, how to use a hammer. I don't fucking know. <laughs> I was not raised in a bubble where I learned how to use a power drill. It confuses me. Even though my brothers have tried to show me 20 times, I cannot understand the mechanism of a power drill for some reason, which sounds so stupid, but they also need me to help them change their address at the post office. See, when you say this, because I directed myself outside of identity and outside of bubbles from a very early age, I know all those things. And and I look at them as these are things that every human needs to know or any human needs to know. I never I never looked at stuff and thought, oh, the the, the females in the community, they'll take care of those things. I just looked at it and I thought, I need to know how to cook. Like I, so very egalitarian Vikings. Like whatever you're good at, do that. No, no, be good at everything, or at least know something about everything. You, you sure. can't, I, fundamentally, I, I developed a sense of you can't trust other people, and you certainly can't rely on them. And so I, I don't look at any household tasks or life activities as something that I can get other people to do. Okay. I think that I have to be able to do it all. So, perfectly ties into identity. I'm a part of a community. I don't have to do anything alone. It takes a village, baby. And I got a village. If I need to get something high from a shelf, I ask a brother. If I need something drilled, I ask a brother. If I need something done, I call my dad. When I buy a house, my dad's like, call me, I'll come help you. I'm like, great. I don't have to do shit alone. So I don't have to learn these skills independently. Now, if I wanted to survive the zombie apocalypse, I absolutely should adopt your way of thinking. But because I live in a society, okay, here's the the thing. My farm brother asked me, Um, cause you know, I'm partnered with somebody who is not a UFC fighter. (laughs) He goes, what's it, you know, doesn't, isn't important to you that you have a man who can like carry a gun and like use a knife and like fight somebody. And I was like, no, I live in a modern society. Hopefully we'll live in such a privileged bubble that I'll never have to fight anybody and he'll never have to fight anybody. Mm -hmm. But for farm brother, he has to have all those things cause he lives on a farm where he like has to have the strength to lift hay bales and stuff. And like, I don't have to know that. 
So like, again, I, I think like when you live in a certain place, you get the luxury of living a very privileged and then uneducated existence. I will say it is a disadvantage for me to have to rely on my community and at the same time, an advantage for the community to all be useful to each other. And that's what's nice about a community is that we do need each other and that's what maintains the community. So it is a little bit of a crutch, I would say. But also the benefits are so lovely. Always have someone to call at 2 a.m., everyone to come get you, help you, hospital bills, money, like f just someone to hang out with, have a good time with. It's just like so, I, I love having a community of siblings here. I just, it's the greatest. We're reliant, you know, when they need help, I help. When I need help, they help. It's just beautiful. But like I said, I'm not as capable. Yeah, I think the the aspects of the community that work that way go towards that practical relationship of you do this job, I'll do this mm -hmm. job, we'll divvy up the work. We don't even have to love each other. We can just exchange money. We can do whatever it is. Uh, we, we, but we make society better. And we all split up the tasks. A lot to be said for that. And certainly, you know, I'm not doing every job that could possibly be done uh, in my environment. You know, sure. there, are, there are other human beings here doing things. I don't grow my own food. You mm -hmm. know, there are, there are limits. But I know how. Yeah. And, and I've always felt that it's important to know how and have some experience doing almost every job that you possibly totally. can. Yeah. Because it enables you when you interact with those people to have some grasp of their world. And when mm -hmm. someone shows up at your door and says, you know, hey, I'm selling eggs. They're five thousand dollars each. You you can know no, that's wrong. That's not how much it costs to make eggs, and, and yeah. you don't you don't know it just because you don't have the money. But you actually know it. And I think the more you can actually know about the world, the more you can connect with the bubbles and interact with them. That's and correct. It's, it's smoother. I, think that's I, right. I feel that like one of my core fundamental values is knowing as much as you can about how everything works. Yes, I think you're right. So. One of the things that I, I do admire about you is that you have that. Like you do have a brain. Like every time I have a bad thing happen with my OBS, I am reliant on someone smarter than me to help me. And it's kind of bad for my live shows. It slows down production. It makes me look unprofessional. And at the same time, it's really nice to have a friend I can call and be like, Q, save me. <laughs> and that's kind of me. I hope like it somewhat makes you feel needed until it could feel like a burden. And then I've ruined my community symbiotic relationship by being too much of an asking person. So I know eventually I cannot be the constant streamer that like cannot run her OBS. But in my defense, I've only been really actively streaming this aggressively since my diagnosis ish, April, March, as a way to compensate for my podcasts. So like I'm trying, okay? But like that's what's so good about a community, but also the crutches. So it's like give and take in all of it. Like sometimes I worry about you like, oh, he doesn't have a community. But then you do have a community because you have people you love. Yeah. And they love you and they are in your life, right? So I am I, am I not your like community to some extent? Oh, yeah, yeah. In terms of the uh, the aspects of psychological and emotional stuff, I think that I do have a community. Right. It, it's very much on the practical side of things that I don't feel uh, community or identity. That makes sense to me. In our friendship, are we friends because of who we are? Or are we friends because we both became people who like similar enough things to like the people that we are. You know, whenever you get anywhere near to the question of why do you love me or why are we friends or what is it? Uh, I have found that the closer you are to someone, the more answers there are to that question. And, and if you really love someone, you should never run out of answers to that question. Yeah, this was really good. OK, this turned out like better than I thought it was going to go, because for a second there I was like, I don't understand the direction of this conversation. And then I was like, OK, got it. And this is really lovely because we always end up doing this in our friendship. We argue and then I yell at you and then we end up saying basically the same thing, but in different ways. And then it frustrates me. But we are so different. Like we are so different. You could not live my life and I cannot live yours. Definitely. But I definitely think that was mostly because of like I was I especially since I'm a borderline like all borderlines are doing are trying to figure out who they are and what identity they are. So when they're like, you're just you, it's like, hmm, what does that mean? Because I've been abandoned my whole life for being me and me is gay. So what does it mean to not have an identity if my identity is the thing that people are rejecting me for? That's part of why I don't like the identity is, is to me, you are Brittany and nothing else. And because you are Brittany, there is no potential for me to ever question or reject 
or do anything other than just say, this is part of Brittany. Okay, wait, can bad habit... So would you say a rapist is an identity? I, I No. Okay. I mean, wait, wait, no. so would we say a drunk driver is an identity? No. Okay, so maybe that's where there's another conversation to be had because I think people go, I identified you as a rapist. So now your identity is rapist. And then in my head, identity matters because people treat you based off your identity, even though they shouldn't, but they Mm kind of should if your actions make your identity. Like a serial cheater is an identity, but it's not an identity the way being gay is or a man is or a woman or black. So yes, we shouldn't, it shouldn't matter to us really if we're women or men or black or whatever, because that's like you're born that way. But if you do an action, which some people think, but see, with gayness and transness, which I think is like you're born as, people will think like you choose as. So they treat you differently because we have to treat people differently based off those things. I treat children differently on their identity than a grown up, right? Well, you're reminding me like my, my mind is going to where yours might be in terms of, you know, things people do. And immediately when you talk about something like rape, I think that there's a difference between for almost every crime there's a difference between someone who hasn't done it and someone who has done it, which is you know what it's like to do it. You know you're capable of it. You are less afraid of it. It stops being mysterious, and it just becomes an option for you. And it reminds me of the fact that we, um, you know, there was this issue with uh, military people where, you know, we used to send them into combat without the right kind of training, right kind of training. We, We used to send them into combat without training to kill people. And so we would basically say, here's a rifle, there's the enemy, and people would just sort of shoot in random directions because they didn't want to kill. Like, we didn't teach people how to be murderers. So we learned that, no, you have to put them into training so they get used to pointing their gun at a human form and pulling the trigger. And then we realized, okay, we can train people to do that. We don't have a way to train people not to do that. So we now have a process where once you've joined the military and you've gone through this training, you've learned to be a killer who is comfortable shooting people. And then people leave the military and they come out and they become cops. And suddenly the cops are shooting more people. Why? Because they did, they, they've they gone from being the kind of person who fundamentally was afraid of killing someone and really tried hard to avoid it to being someone who has been psychologically made comfortable with it. And they're yeah. willing to do it. They know... From, you know, there's a lot of reasons for it, but it's just you've changed that person. Can we say that those people now should identify as killers or potential killers or you know, whatever label you'd want to put on it? Maybe. Like, they're definitely different people. Hmm. But at the same time, that's not really who they are because they could still be Catholics or Jews yeah. or whatever they are. You know, like, it's, it doesn't feel like an identity to me. It feels like just some part of their life experience that has changed them. Like, you are a rape victim. This has changed you in certain ways that you you know what it's like. And maybe if you were raped again, it would be different. I don't know. Like, there's there's all sorts of things that that happen in our lives that change who we are. I don't – I try not to generalize. Like, even there, I know that everyone who's been through this training has probably become better at killing. But if I met someone who had gone through that training, I would not immediately think, oh, this person's a killer. They're one right. of them. Like, I, I would still want to see them first as an individual. Right, right. Okay, so I agree with that. Obviously, that's why I'm good at my job. Because, like, if I allowed my biases, like, that's why I try to separate, like, how I aggressively emotionally feel. And it's hard for me. Like, it is hard for me. Like, I know my lived, lived experience informs, like, how I can react to certain people. And it makes me, like, on guard. But I'm also trying my hardest to learn that what I'm experiencing is, like, only happening to me. So I need to look at other people and have them experience me in a way that makes sense for the circumstance Mm -hmm. versus how I feel about the circumstance. So I think that's what's so hard though, is that, that, well, no, actually it's quite easy one-on-one. It's quite difficult in groups. I have identities. So I, I do agree that the best thing for society is to move in small, small groups as much as possible. So you can clearly see people past their identities. But as a collective and a society, it's nice to have an identity. USA. USA. It's really good to be an American because I know what it means to be an American and it works because I was born into it and I get this identity. Maybe, but it's also where it becomes most dangerous. What do you mean? Because you can very easily get behind your your country, my country, right or wrong. 
Like, oh, sorry. When we're in a war um, with someone, they must be the bad guys. So, so sorry. I think everyone's the bad guy. Let me rephrase because everyone's the good guy. I don't actually like not USA like a uh, government like USA like we're all Americans. Like in my see again, I go way down your systems. I go way down to the individual. So again, I don't think of the government. That's a system. I think about the people. So like when I'm with my people, I'm like, we're all the same. We're all Americans. And they're like, yeah, we are all the same. Minus us. Like even if we're black or Asian or gay or straight, like we're all Americans and that's what's great. So like that in that way, that feels good. But if I start I, saying so I I'm Americans. I think it's, it's not that we're all Americans. It's the maneuver you just made. It's the you're black, I'm gay, you're Asian. Oh, but we're all Americans. Let's look for the unifying group is the maneuver. Right. And right. if you were if you were with someone from Vietnam and someone from you know, Spain right. or whatever, you wouldn't say, well, I'm an American. You're not. You'd say, hey, we're all earthlings. Like you'd right. find some unifying group. Right. But the problem is the bigger you get, the more it is, the more it doesn't mean anything either. If I say, yeah, oh, we're all just humans, but that human fucked my three-year-old. Okay. Yeah. We might all be humans, but I'm about to treat you very different. So again, it's like when we go too big – we like, I think we lose ourselves and that's why we're, it's easier to hate people. It is easier to be bigoted when everyone's just an, a bigger identity than you can humanize. But I think when you have a lived experience of that identity, it's easier to humanize. It's very easy for me to humanize like traditional conservative POC immigrants who abuse their kids with belts and tell them they're faggots and kill them. <laughs> <laughs> I totally get it. I'm like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I understand this bubble. But like a white person hearing that might be like, what the fuck? And I'm like, no, no, no. It makes sense. Like, and I don't mean white. Like, okay, I actually want to ask you a quick question. My whole life growing up, my whole life, when people found out we were 10 kids, they'd go Mormon or Catholic. <laughs> my whole life. So when you earlier said like some Catholics have one child, I was like, now. Now. But not before. But then I was like, wait, where you live in the States, because I live West Coast, where you live, wherever that is, where when people say they're Catholic, could that mean one child? Yeah. Um, Catholic would mean I – mean, Catholic has always sort of meant large family, like everywhere okay. around the world. That's sort, okay. of sort of a pattern. So that's true. Oh, okay. But, but also large family is just a rural farm thing. True. And those and people are what, much more like my people. Yeah, that, I associate it much more with that. I associate it much more with I'm going to have a bunch of kids so that I have someone to milk the cows. Okay. I will say the white people with big families who grew up in that kind of a background who have like obligated – not obligation, but like a they have to fight their – with those people seem much more similar to my family because what it is, I think big dynamics allow bigger problems or more problems. And then more kids with variation. So you're more likely if 10 kids to get – Three gay kids out of ten kids. My mother, my father. And that makes it so they are forced to – they're they're forced, the children, to then ask themselves, how do I love my parents when they don't love this thing about me, but they love me? And then that causes the connection to everything everywhere all at once, which means the identity is connecting us and blah, 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 blah. And that makes everyone feel seen and heard. And, oh, look at this universal experience we're having. How beautiful. That's why when we do, like, rape support groups, it's really nice that a lot of us have a shared experience. But amongst rape victims – there is tension because some of us disagree with how we express our experience. Mm -hmm. So then we're not now identifying through being we can't all get along as rape victims because our identity, though the same, is not it's the same lived experience. And so there's like that's where the new identity comes in. What kind of a rape victim are you? You know, so that's where I think the chaos ensues. But that's why I think you have to find the right bubble to help you as a specific person, because you are like you're more likely to fit into certain bubbles. Maybe. Oh, it cut off, didn't it? Hold on, we're cut off. Wait. Technology. Technology. Ugh, this technology trying uh, to murder me. It's okay, I wasn't saying anything. I think I caught you. You were about to say something, though. Oh, I said it, it, that that makes sense to me, and I definitely agree. Yeah. Uh, I, I sometimes feel like I would use the word bubble differently, oh. but mm -hmm. I, 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 for me, bubble feels much more like a thing that you're kind of trapped in or a thing like that. Whereas you often are using it more as just a constructed set of things. I don't think you're trapped. I don't think anyone's ever trapped. I really believe everyone's where they're supposed to be because everyone wants to be. Until they don't want to be enough where the need pushes them out of the bubble. But the bubble still works for them to some extent. At least for me, I visit my bubbles. I like my Catholic bubble. I don't live there 24-7 or most of the time. But there's nothing like – I just – it makes – it's nice to visit. It's nice to go back there. But I couldn't go – back there if I felt trapped by it 
really, but I wouldn't want to live there because then I'd feel trapped. Does that make sense? So you yeah. don't, you know what I mean? You're only trapped if you think you can't leave. I, I feel like if I had to describe it, it might be that I've taken a bunch of the bubbles and I've like cut them in half and mm. opened them up and just set them down so that I can reach into them without having to go into them. Ooh, that's interesting. Um, that makes a lot of sense though, because if I look at you and I think about, I'm needy. Like I'm very needy. I need a community. I need a group of people. I have like 15 people in my inner circle. That's like it, but I can't handle much more. But I still on the side of that am so needy that I have a discord where I run a community because I need to hear from people. I need to learn from other people. So I think, am I just more needy or do I, I need to immerse myself more, I think maybe, but I feel like you do too. Uh, I, I enjoy socializing. My inner circle is definitely much, much smaller. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. I would probably put it at somewhere between three and four people. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, we can keep talking, but I literally have to go. I'm already 30 minutes over. Okay, this has been wonderful, though. Thank you so much for joining me, Q. If you guys have any comments or questions, leave them down in the sections below. Um, and with that said, great podcast. Like, really great. I think this is really great. Yeah. Anything you want to say to anybody or no? No, just good conversation. Okay. All right. Talk to you guys soon. Bye. Stuck in my head in real life while I'm bed. My belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool. Done.